Hi, everybody. Welcome tonight to this amazing program. Um, tonight is going to be, welcome to the Let's Get Real program with Coach Menachem Berenfeld. Tonight is going to be our 54th year that we are doing this every Sunday night. Again, I want to thank, as I do every week, all the people that come every week, um, that tell their friends about it, their neighbors, their family. They post it on the WhatsApp, WhatsApp statuses. They email it around. And the feedback that me and Menachem are getting is absolutely unbelievable. And um, every week there's another, there's a, there's a back-end story. You have a front-end story and the back-end story. So Baruch Hashem is unbelievable. Last week's program was a very, very uh, powerful program. We spoke about you know, tragedies and grief. And uh, we got a tremendous amount of feedback as well. It was a beautiful program. I want to thank again Glenn Homo for coming on and being the Kazakh, so many people. Um, again, for all the people that are watching the share on the replay on YouTube, please don't forget to click on the subscribe button for Coach Manhattan's channel and click on the like button. Smash the like buttons so he gets a lot of likes. And uh, I really appreciate that. I want to give a special thank you to all our advertising sponsors who always promote us every week, the Lakewood Scoop over here in Lakewood. A special thank you to Rabbi Anif from Chazak. Chazak offers programming for all. Please go to chazak.org. And a special thank you to Chai Kaufman and Shmuel Summer from JCN, Jewish Content Network, always promoting us across all the Jewish platforms. Again, for anybody who's here for the first time, we have the share every Sunday night at 10 p.m. This Zoom ID, different topics. We have different rabbonim, therapists, unbelievable people. It's been absolutely unbelievable. Um, I always want to start off next. It's not next Sunday. It's going to be Shuas. So we're not going to we're not going to have a share because next week Sunday night is going to be Shuas. So the next Sunday night will be May 23rd. We have a very powerful program, and um, I advise you to come in very early because it's going to be thousands of people. We're going to have Rabbi Wawa Jacobson. We're discussing. You ready? Mordecai, you ready? I'm ready. Discussing life after divorce, that whole parsha. So um, it's a very powerful topic. Um, it's uh, it's gonna it's gonna be part one of many series. So uh, please, if you know anybody, please tell them to join. It should be unbelievable. Again, the Coach Menachem Show is collaborating with OK Clarity to the greater health and wellness of the Jewish community around the globe. OK Clarity is the online platform for mental health support in the Jewish community. On their online platform, you can find best therapists, coaches, nutritionists to get your forms and stay inspired. Links will be emailed after the show from Coach Menachem. Tonight we have the schluss to have with us one of the best therapists that I know, with motivational speakers, and also a personal friend of me and Coach Menachem for many, many years. He used to be my neighbor. He moved away because complex personality, whatever. It's not. I don't want to get into it now. But um, he's a great guy, and I appreciate him coming back. And uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But let's start first with Coach Menachem. Opening words. So I want to welcome everyone to another show and let's get real with Coach Menachem. Baruch Hashem, we're up to number 54. And I thank you all for being here tonight. And like we heard, Klal Yisrael is still going through grief, start trying to figure out um, how we manage when we don't understand things and to grab on, to become strong with Amun and Betochen. Tonight, the truth is, we have Mordechai Weinberger brings us back to the initial stages of this whole program. When we started out and uh, Mordechai, you came on unconditionally, not knowing, nobody knew what this is all about. And you were uh, asking to come on once and twice. And you are one of the reasons why we got this program started. And one of the reasons why we're still here, running strong, and I want to thank you for believing in us in the beginning and for being, for backing us, the support all along the way, making sure that we continue and Hashem should, should give you, to shower you with all that you need, and be able to continue with all the help that you helped call Yisrael and you should be able to reach many, many, many more. So oh, tonight's topic, deriving around complicated people and personality <laughs> orders. Disorder, sorry, personality disorder. I believe it's a very sensitive topic because many people, they're coming on tonight with the questions about other people. And, you know, sometimes it's not the people they're um, trying to work out. Sometimes it's themselves. They are the ones who are complicated. Now, how, how do we figure that out? I think tonight it's very hard to make everybody happy. Obviously, people in relationships, you know, a, a wants one thing and B wants the other thing. And how do you work it out? When, when, it's, uh, when the solution is just open communication, so we can talk about basic open communication and uh, seeing when to give in, sometimes to be mevata. But not always that that's a solution. And what do you do when you realize you're dealing with, with somebody with a disorder? Sometimes 
open communication and being mevat is the wrong thing. So I think tonight we have a lot to learn and I'm happy to have Mordechai Weinberger, which I think we're going to get a, a lot of the preview of the book that he's putting out on this topic so that we can understand the basic ideas, understand what we're dealing with and to see, hopefully, in Mitzvah Shem, get some tips so that we can walk away with something we can use and not only being bombarded with some things, information that we don't like. So thank you, Mordechai, for being with us. And Mr. Shem, we love a siyata de shmaya, Mitzvah Shem. Beautiful opening. Uh, let's get into tonight's shir. Tonight's shir, we're going to be learning first the Zeche Nishmas Zolka Ahava, Ahuva, Basra of Daniel. The yard side was Chof Vav Ir this past Shabbos. And also the Zeche Nishmas Yehuda Kanzer. He was Yehuda, I think his name is Kanzer, who was Nifter Thursday uh, in Detroit. Suddenly he was a young man. He was 46 or 47 years old. He left over six children from Detroit. Should have a big schus. For these two people's neshamas, also going to learn the Zeich Nishmas by Mordechai Weinberger's father, who lived there many years ago, Daniel Yoyna Eli Melech Yosef, Ben Reb David, and also to co one of the co uh, makers over here on the and behind the scenes. And let's get real that nobody knows about. We never talk about him because he's very makved. Uh, Arnoy Fried for his mother, Chai Lea Bas Reb David. Uh, so again, before we get into tonight's share, I just want to put a little overview again also myself. Tonight's share is a very important share. Um, I think most people can relate to dealing with complex people. And most people probably know somebody that has some type of personality disorder. There's many different personality disorders. I actually Googled it before the share. I was shocked how many there were. Um, we're going to try to cover as many as possible with Mordecai, who's uh, actually putting out a book on this. And we got a lot of emails, a tremendous amount. We are going to try to combine the questions. Yes, we got all the trigger ones. We got tons of those. Don't worry, we're going to cover that. But uh, we're going to get into all that stuff, Mr. Shem. And uh, let's all let's, uh, we'll gain from it. I'm going to read Mordecai Weinberger's bio. And then the floor is yours. Mordecai Weinberger. Has helped several thousands of people. He's, he's several. He has he has several public programs that are listened to by thousands of people weekly. He's a noted author of three bestseller books. He's a weekly contributor in the Yated Nemon. He is currently in the final stages of his fourth book called "Thriving Around Complicated People." And tonight we are going to get a sneak peek of the book. We're getting a free preview, and let's get into it. Mordechai Weinberger, the floor is yours. So shalom aleichem, everyone. Welcome, and it is a pleasure to be here with you all. With all these intros, I just got to give a very short intro. So first to Rabbi Yoshi Parnas, as he said, a great neighbor of mine. At the same time, I had Coach Menachem as my neighbor. But as Yoshi said, I think the reason I had to move after a year was I was like right at his, right across the street. And that was way too close. But anyhow, we've remained best friends since. And Coach Menachem, it was a pleasure knowing you as well. As Yoshi has also mentioned, we have over here Aaron Eichfried, I would say a childhood friend, probably from my best friends that knows me the longest out there, and pleasure having you, Aaron Eich, as well. So thank you. A separate little shout out to a wonderful friend, to Rabbi Avrumi Shon, that's over here. I just got to give that uh, shout out. Friend of the family, very, very dear and very close. So, and thank you all for listening. The concept about dealing with complicated people and personality disorders is one that has a tremendous amount of emotions connected to it. And when you've got a lot of emotions to something, it gets very complicated to unravel ourselves. And instead of the love that we have, we want to connect to another person, we want to make it cohesive that we should really work together. Unfortunately, the depth of pain or the bias that we'll discuss in a moment that goes on in our minds will actually do the opposite. Instead of making a relationship work out, instead of helping and connecting as we want, unfortunately, we can be doing the exact opposite, all under the mental intentions that we're right and they're wrong. So first, let's just understand a relationship. Relationships start at an early age, a little infant, a baby, a newborn is crying and is in pain and is looking for love and attachment from the mother and father, from the parents. And the baby has that need. And when the mother gives it to the baby, the baby is soothing. It could be needing to eat. It could be having a stomachache. It could even be needing to just eliminate or getting a changed diaper. But that connection, that attachment, that safety, a child feels, an infant feels, then we get older. Then we have that same connection, again, with our parents, but now we start having it with friends. We start having maybe going to preschool. 
a play group, wherever that should be. And now the relationship starts changing. It's I want something, others want something. And how are we going to work it out together? What happens is we always think we're right. But at a younger age, we're still fighting. Then we get older to the teenage years. And then we start realizing there's another person. There's me. I would do things differently. And again, just understanding relationships. It's about growing and connecting with people. If each of these stages, we learn the skill that there's me, there is you, I think I'm right, you think you're right, how do we work this out? And then we start realizing, wow, if through communication, that person has a point. So I'll share with you a great story that happened recently. There was a family that they had a family birthday, and they made up that they're going to take the parents out for their birthday, and there are married siblings. And three siblings, two, all three agreed, we are not going to take our parent out on Sunday evening because one of the children can't do it, can't make it. Sure enough, things change during the week. And guess what's the only night they can take out that parent on the birthday? That Sunday evening. So they put out the family chat, okay, we're doing Sunday. And all of a sudden that one sibling says, hey, we all agreed we are not going out Sunday evening. And they say, I know, but things changed. And that sibling started like writing upset messages. And then two things could have happened. It could have been a family fight, which that sibling A is correct. Or it could have gone the other way, which what happened is one sibling called that, that sibling A and said, this is not about you. You're right. We all agree that we are not going to go out on Sunday evening with mommy and Tati. But other things happened. Us other two siblings, things came up and we can't do it. So now we've got a couple of options. Me, let's say, and my other sibling can take mommy and Tati out. <clears throat> option one on Sunday. Option two is you can take mommy out on your own another time. Option three, maybe we wait two, three weeks and we could all take mommy and Tati out. But we cannot do any other day this week. Once brother or sibling A got their feeling that they were right, the family changed on them, the process, so there was the validation, now some solutions were discussed, and actually two of them went out, and that third sibling, A, which was 100% right, made another option, and they all got together, and it worked out. But just recognized how we have perceptions in relationships. You might even be right. And everyone changed on you, but what will happen then? So let's just hold off a minute. Let me share with you a nice three psychology theories that I personally like a lot. The first one that I'd like to discuss is called attribute bias. Attribute bias has a couple of subcategories. And one of those subcategories are called actor observer bias. What is this fancy word? Beautiful theory. True story happened with a family of mine, and just listen to this. They're in a car service driving in Barra Park, and not picking any culture, whatever it was, there is a, there's a red light, car in front, they're the second car, and it turns green. And that car service starts honking, full power. And he starts yelling, look at these people here. They're on their cell phones when it turns green. And this guy's getting so worked up and the person in the back, he's going, oh, relax. It's just a red light that turned green. And they're only like three seconds off till they drove. Sure enough, if you drive around Brooklyn, you know that you can't go more than two lights before you're getting stuck at a red light. And now this same car service is at the red light, first car. And sure enough, he is checking his phone. And just then it turns green and someone honks him. And he starts yelling, look at these people here in Brooklyn, yelling, nervous, tense, what's wrong with them? This very same guy that two lights ago was doing the same thing to that person when he's in the front seat, that front car, instead of saying, whoa, the guy is right, he's going, look at these crazy people here, these people that are stressed. So attribute bias is a concept that our Kaddish Baruch Hu created in every one of our brains, in our minds, and that is when it comes to us, we are naturally biased. We are naturally, or as you might say, Adam Kar of Eitzelatzmai. We will not see our weaknesses, and therefore, we need someone, or many times, a friend or an outside source to give us a concept, to put it in view 
of what's really going on. There's another concept I'd like to share, and we're going to be discussing a lot of these concepts throughout the evening, and that is called narrative therapy. Narrative therapy is what's the story we're telling ourselves? What, what do we have in here? Are we going around that? I'm a victim. People don't like me. People attack me. People don't value me. Whatever I say, no one listens to. Or is our narrative saying we're good, we're successful? Yeah, there are times there are challenges. We could make mistakes. It's okay. What's so important about this narrative therapy and how we view ourselves? It is very important because this narrative therapy is telling us how we are going to respond. Watch this. Imagine Ushi calls me up, up with Coach Menachem both on the phone, and Ushi is going, Mordechai, I have to tell you something. And right away, Ushi is going to be so cute, so happy, but so direct that I'm nervous. And now, therefore, my response, my go to Ushi is, hey, why are you attacking me? Why are you doing this? Just by my perception of Ushi, Arr. I responded with a, Arr. now imagine Ushi didn't say anything, but I know Ushi is go could be like this. So when I go, hi, Ushi, what do you want? Don't you know I didn't do anything? I will start because of my narrative in my mind, how he's going to respond. I might attack him even before he said anything. But then Ushi is going to respond to my attack with an attack. And me, with my attribute bias, I'm going to go around and look at Ushi. He is attacking me nonstop. But don't worry, guys. That's why there's a coach Menachem. And when I know we have a coach Menachem on the line with putting things in perspective, let's take a step back. Let's be mindful about what we're doing. So when you've got a coach Menachem and an Ushi together, me, Mordechai, I feel so safe. And I say, Ushi is the nicest guy to have on. Ushi keeps the flow going. Ushi has a way that even if there aren't conversations or anything happening, he has a way of asking those right questions, pinpoints the exact point that you want to discuss. And he has a way of bringing it out on such eloquent, on such an eloquent term, such a positive, powerful way that this program without Ushi and Coach Menachem together, they wouldn't be a whole. Now, do you notice the difference of just having Coach Menachem on the line and I speak to Ushi and he loves calling me Mordechai, you know, just having that. And he knows, you know, certain triggers that I have, but having the narrative in my mind, having that attribute bias, knowing that it's me and it's not Ushi, it's not the other person, will automatically change the way I respond. And a large part of the book that we that I've now sort of the end, where probably in the last 25%, the last quarter of the book, Thriving, uh, Thriving with Complicated People, was an interesting process. I first started titling the book because in order to write a book, you need to have a goal. And it was battling personality disorders. And I realized the book has had so much hate fights. Then it went dealing with personality disorders. And I go, there's still like so much like challenges going on. Then it was dealing with complicated people. And I still found it. There isn't love. There isn't growth. Then I realized it's about thriving with complicated situations. And I just use it complicated people because that's really, it's a people's book. It's really about don't look at a person by a diagnosis because one therapist might say it as a diagnosis. A person might say it doesn't. One person might say this person is complicated and another one will say the same person is a wonderful person. When we start recognizing, and this is a large part of this book and of this program this evening, let's not diagnose the other person. Let's not get stuck into the narrative that they are complicated. Let's get into the narrative that I have the skills how to deal with people that might be very different than me. And when I deal with it differently, there is love, there is caring, there's kindness, there is an openness, and you're actually able to listen. What would you say if I tell you that that complicated person or quote unquote, that personality disorder is actually right? What happens if they hit some of your weaknesses? And they're right. And actually you can, you can benefit by changing and by listening. You can be a better person and that is the therapy. When we work with people to help them have a great relationship with complicated people, 
and with people that have personality disorders, it's about changing the dance. Don't get into the narrative that it's hard, it's painful, it's complicated, you'll never grow, you'll never get there. It's a disaster. We don't want to do that. If you're going to do that, you're fell, you just fell into that trap. You just fell into that car service guy that when he's the second car, he is honking. And when he's the first car, look at all these crazy people out there that are honking. Go ahead. Let's start with some of you guys because there's still a lot more that I could say. But the concept is about us. It's our narrative. We have the power to change the dance, to change the relationship. Okay, what a beautiful opening. We have a lot of powerful questions tonight, so we'll start off slow. Let's take a poll. Let's get everybody warmed up. And um, again, if any, okay, let's just let's just put down the the, guide, the rules over here. We're going to try tonight. Anybody wants to ask a live question, raise. You could raise your hand. It's one of the things on the bottom. It says reactions, and you could um, raise raise your hand and then text your question. It means if you really want to ask live, if you just want to text the question, you can text it. But again, going live, people who ask live go first. That's first of all. Second of all, you have Mordechai Weimer, who's one of the best therapists personally that I know. And um, I know it's very hard to get into him. So if you finally have him here and you have him at your disposal, at your disposal, please take advantage, turn on your video, ask him anything. We, like I always say, Mordechai, Mordechai, I always say, we're not asking for ourselves and our mother-in-laws. We're asking for my neighbors and we understand, you know, we, we all, it's self-understood. So let's take a poll and uh, you can take a drink me all. Okay, the question goes like this. Everybody can answer, it's anonymous. Let's just get a feeling from the crowd. When someone disagrees with you, we, question mark, defend our opinion you agree with the person i feel guilty that i stated my opinion so there's three options either defend my opinion you agree with the person very easy to agree or three right away feel guilty that i stated my opinion the second question is when you have challenges with people a boss a spouse a neighbor number one is you know they're the issue right away number two some, sometimes i'm the issue sometimes they are the issue or option three i'm always the issue so please answer those two questions um, okay, five seconds. What do you think? What do you think the winners? I see some very. Mordecai, you could see the answers, but they, they can't see yet. But uh, everybody says the right answer. Why does everybody say the right answer? I'm disagreeing with it. Actually, I'm disagreeing good, good, with good. it. Well, well, we got to share. We got to share. Well, well, I know that we're gonna do it again. Okay. We're gonna five, do this again. four, three, two, five, four, three, five, four, three, five. Okay. Here we go. Okay. 77% of people said when someone disagrees with you, you defend your opinion. We have a lot of fighters over here. 14% of people, we agree with the person. And 9% of people, I feel guilty and I state my opinion. That's the first question. Very interesting. I'm, I'm actually shocked with that answer. Number two, when you have challenges with people, boss, spouse, or neighbor, one, you know they are the issue. 84% say, you know, we got to give and take. Sometimes I'm the issue. Sometimes they are the issue. And 3% of the people are, I'm always the issue. Basically, very confident people. They always defend their opinion. And they know for sure they're not the issue. So, okay, let's X that out. Um, hold on, hold on, Ushi. Okay. I want to do this again. I'd like to redo this poll, write down the numbers, Ushi, because I'd like to compare it when I ask the question again. Okay, hold on one second. Great, so write them down. And what I'd like everyone to understand is as, a, as he's writing them down to understand the concept, yep. we've all done fantastic. So when someone disagrees with you in a healthy relationship, it is safe to defend your opinion, which we've got 77% people have agreed to that. And the second question is when you have that you feel challenged by a boss, a spouse, or a neighbor, some of you, or I should say most of you, 84% said that sometimes, some, that sometimes I'm the issue and sometimes they're the issue, very healthy. I now wanna change the question. When you are dealing with someone that you are stressed about, someone that's triggering you, whoever that person could be, now it could be a spouse, it could be someone that you have a very challenging relationship. You don't have the right communication with them. Now the same thing, when they disagree with you, what do you do? Do you still defend yourself? Do you still, or do you agree with that person or you just feel guilty that you did that? I want you to realize it's not talking about now a regular healthy relationship. Now a challenging relationship where it's a complicated relationship between you and them. We're not gonna get into the diagnosis, just basically. What happens then? Let's see if, are you still able to defend yourself or do you just give in? Or do you start going, oh, I was so wrong. I'm the problem, I even started it. I should have just shut my mouth. Do you start feeling guilty? And the same thing is with the second question. 
when you have a challenge with a person, let's say you're again, you're both your spouse, but it's complicated. Do you know they're the issue? Do you think sometimes you're the issue? Or do you go with this person, you know, I'm really the problem. Every time I interact with them, I feel terrible. Basically, both questions, Mordechai, you're changing it to saying now you know you're dealing with a person that's a real... Challenge. Challenge, challenge person. You. Right. Yeah. Okay. I want to see if the numbers will change because that is the point of this program. Okay. So everybody answer the same questions with that same mindset. You know you're dealing with that fair person. And now when you disagree with you, how do you deal with that? And also... I think sure is the right answer, the right word. I don't know. What's the right word? Complex? Yeah. Complex is a great one. Yes. When you have challenges with those complex people, you know they're the issue. I mean, of course, we all know they're the issue. Okay. Let's let's share the results, okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a bunch of live questions. One also, so let's just get to that. Great. So okay, notice that. Now. Okay. So now look how the, 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 the results change. Defend your opinion, 40%, much less people defend their opinion when they're dealing with the complex people. The last time was 77%. And the 40% that, that you agree with the person now changed to 34%. So you see, I feel guilty when I stay in my opinion because they have the, the guilt because they're dealing with complex person. You see how the numbers shifted. Let's go to the second question. When you have challenges with, with these people that are both spouses that you know that they're the problem, last time was only 30% of people said, you know they were the issue. Now 56% of people know that they're the issue. And 35% um, is that I, I sometimes me, sometimes them, which was actually 84% last time. And 9% I'm always the issue, which actually went up more. Interesting, that went up more. Okay, Mordechai, you proved your point. That's right. And that's why I'd like everyone to recognize what just changed here. Can we realize again, going back to this attribute bias, that we all go around knowing and thinking we have a great relationship, we have great communication skills. However, when we're now stuck in a challenging relationship, do you see what happens? Right away, we start going into guilt. Over 50% have dropped their ability to defend their opinion. So you're a healthy, strong, smart, intelligent person that you can have great relationships and you can work out through communication your issue with another. But the minute you're dealing with a challenging person and your narrative is whatever I say will be challenged, whatever I say will be hurt, whatever I say will be misconstrued, whatever I say will be used against me, right away, 40, over 50% over will pull back from your opinion. And what you'll do is almost doubling the numbers. I'll just agree with that person. And then also double the number is the one that now feels guilty. Why did I even bring up that topic? So just to recognize the challenge that happens in our life and based on this narrative, how now we will react differently to the other person, which changes everything that goes on. So, Raboshi, let's go ahead. Let's start with we have some a lot of live questions. The problem is some of the live questions are jumping straight into the kishkos. I want to start first with the basics. All the live ones, let's just let's just wait a few minutes because I want to get some of the basics. I think like we have to like build up a little bit over here. The first question I want to ask you, which is you know nichla, a lot of questions together, but I think it's a very good groundwork. I sometimes shut down and I don't get along with my spouse. We argue. We do argue. Does that mean that we don't have a normal relationship? That's the question, full question? Full question. All right. Basically a very olive based question. People fight. That's right. So I want to maybe give a step a, a, a little easier to Hakdama, just to explain a little about relationships, especially about the words of the diagnosis and about the concept of personality disorders. And then we'll get that. Let's understand that as we say, said in the Hakdama, a relationship is healthy. It starts from the first moment we're born and we're interacting, we're relating with our mother, father, primary caregiver. As we get older, relationships build, we have more people. And part of that relationship is how to agree and disagree and how to form a cohesive unit. Now, what happens if someone learns to get their response, their, let's say, attachment with their mother is by yelling and demanding? then what would happen is uh, they learn the way I get what I need is by demanding. What happens to the other way? It's a family that's very into their kids. And all you have to do is ask something once or the parents go, hi, Shefula, how are you doing? I think you might need this. They're already anticipating what you need. So you have not learned to develop the skill to ask because you're expecting that person to ask for you. Then what happens is you're expecting life to people to notice, and you do it to others as well. Now, what happens when you go to, cl to class, to school? You've got friends that aren't doing that. 
So relationships, how we expect to communicate with the outside world is very much formed on our initial attachment that we have with our family. So if you've got, again, a parent that is very giving, you're going to expect that parent that is not giving or authoritative or very tough, or then you will have that. And sometimes there's everything in the middle. So now when we get married and we have a relationship with a person, the first dynamic that happens is we have different belief systems, different expectations. And that different expectations where the challenge comes. Now, challenge doesn't mean a fight. Challenge is actually the most normal way of all communication. Communication is stating, and watch this, even within ourselves, come on, how many of us have daily, I should say even hourly fights within ourselves? Go out, get on the treadmill. Nah, I don't want to. And then you take another piece of cake. And then don't eat that. We have that all the time, and we have this dialogue back and forth. That's normal and healthy. So why, if we can have it within ourselves, and we're called healthy, can't we have it with another person? And they have the same dialogue, and now our job is just to work it out. Communicate. What are your needs? What are my needs? How do we get both our needs met? So in a young couple, Shana Rashaina, besides for all those powerful hormones that we now know that's coming out of the brain that puts you almost on a drug on la-la land that your spouse can do no harm because you're just on a drug, but once that wears off after six months or a year, or hopefully Meretz Hashem till 120, you should be under that influence. But when it wears off and now you're back to a human, now you're all going to have different opinions. How do you work that out? So understand it is normal. This is called relationship to at the end of your, or at a certain earlier point in your marriage, you get to the parts that we're one. The Sagdama number one is everyone is going to have challenges in relationships. It's a must. We have it within ourselves. It's called maturity. As we get older, we see how we want to do things and we accept that we don't have it. Teenagers have a very hard time with that. Teenagers want to be up till five in the morning and they'll get up at 6.30 or seven. It doesn't work that way. But in their mind, the fight, they want everything. As we get older, we get to maturity, and we get to appreciate what we have. We get to know what we want, and we can tell that part of the mind that says, hey, but that neighbor's got more, and that friend's got more, or that one's got better children, whatever it should be. We go, thank you, Hashem, for what I got. When we're getting into marriage, this is normal to have that. One little bit I'd like to give a hakdam as well is because there's a diagnosis that's very popular borderline personality disorder, narcissist personality disorder. And unfortunately, some borderlines have given that diagnosis a terrible name, and some narcissists have given that, that diagnosis a terrible name. I know many people that match the criteria of borderline personality disorder. I could say many of them. I know a few narcissistic, uh, I should say a few people that meet the criteria of narcissistic personality disorder, and they're very nice people. They're actually in pain. I would say most of them want to work through their issues. It's a process, and they'll get there, and a lot also has to do with the spouse or the environment around. I'm going to shoot now my personal numbers, so I've never seen this anywhere, but from my anecdotal experience, I would say 80% of those diagnosed with borderline and narcissistic personality disorder want to get better. They are in pain themselves. They're either related to a personality disorder and therefore whatever reason they have some of the traits, but they say, I don't like being in my own skin. I want to get better. And the process is hard. Unfortunately, I would say 20% are those that are in real pain, don't acknowledge that they're the issue, and they cause so much pain to others. And unfortunately, that 20% are the ones that give the other 80% like this bad name that it's terrible. But there are tremendous I would say the amount of therapists that are experienced, trained in dialectical behavioral therapy and see positive results and see changes are phenomenal. There are, th there are, I should say, several facilities which have an intensive outpatient program from three to nine months with phenomenal results in healing borderline personality disorder. Phenomenal results. And you see the changes and shifts. And me, Ushi, Coach Menachem, we know several of them that have been phenomenal successes in their marriage and how they're growing all over based on the therapy that they're doing. And unfortunately, there's 20% which give a bad name to everyone, which make people's lives so miserable because when we get into it, what complicated people do is they're just complicated. You just can't get it right that all of a sudden everyone is petrified of them. 
So I just want to give that little hagdama that when we get into marriage, having a challenge is healthy. It's part of the process. Having a different view is part of the process. If we can get out of it that we're right, the actor bias, the attribute, the attribute bias, let's give one classic example, Ashi, and then with that, we'll take a question. Interesting example from, as we've mentioned, this attribute bias is considered internal or external stimuli. What does that mean? Imagine this, and this is the example they give. I'm holding a hot cup of tea and I drop it. If I am the one that dropped it, we say it's an external reason. Do you know why I dropped this hot cup of tea? Because it was too hot. And this is again, attribute bias for those that are just coming on. It means that our brain has a filter that when it comes to us, we say we're innocent. When someone else does the same mistake, they're the problem. So attribute bias of an actor of the concept where an actor bias is as follows, that if it's I'm dropping this hot cup of tea, it's because it was so hot. If Ushi should happen to drop the cup of tea, what a schlamazel. That guy can't do anything well. So when we drop it, we say it's, in, it's external. An external reason happened that it happened. But when it's the other guy, we go internally. The person's a schlamazel. The person's a failure. How many times can't they get their house neat, clean, organized? How many times can't the guy not pay his bills? Why does the grocery always have to tell us, you know, you have a balance? Just pay it up. Go ahead. I'm waiting for Ushi to hit back. Come on, Ushi. A lot of, a lot of information. Do you hear me? Oh, yes. Um, I guess it's going to take time, you know, just to get things straight. There's another question that came in. I have a family member that when, when I'm around them, I just feel tense and nervous. I can't pinpoint what it is. There's something about being around that person that I just can't be myself. Can you maybe help us understand what it is? All right. So let's take it, start at the lower level and then work our way up. So here comes a big part, a large part of what we're giving in the Hagdam about everyone, our culture, our environment, what we were raised in is how we live in our bubble. So watch this. I'm speaking to Coach Menachem right now. We're discussing people. And we're having a great time talking about people. And all of a sudden, we might even get some calls coming on. And someone might go, Mordechai, I disagree with everything that you said. And I could all of a sudden take it as, whoa, I was just attacked. So I feel uncomfortable by the words that that person said. In reality, that's not what happened. The person was passionate. The person might be hurt. I might have actually said something that attacked that person that I didn't intentionally mean, but my words might have actually done that. And therefore, what happens is my feelings that I feel uncomfortable, the first thing we want to say is, that's a personality disorder. That person attacked me. Like, it might be true that's their response. But maybe I did do something. Maybe the fact that I have a title therapist is a trigger to that person because they have a terrible experience with therapists. So it's not even what I said, just being who I am is a trigger. So Coach Menachem, let's start with that person's question number one. And the reason why I'm doing it is because in cognitive therapy and in the, di in the dialectical DBT therapy, being mindful is one of the most important skills out there. Mindful is saying, don't get into the reaction mode. Mindfulness is saying, don't attack. Hold on a second. What just happened here? I went on a program. I'm invited by a wonderful coach, Menachem, wonderful Ushi Parnas, to discuss relationships that might be very complicated and how we can thrive. And all of a sudden, this caller is so passionate. And then I can be mindful. Oh, I'm discussing about something that's triggering a lot of people there in pain. So now when they're going to give a response, instead of attacking, it's, oh, my gosh, I feel so bad for you. Your pain must be terrible. Can you please tell me what my words, what I said that just triggered you? So the first step for us to realize is when we're in a relationship and we're feeling uncomfortable because we're afraid of their responses, the first step of mindfulness, if you can do that, if you can take yourself out of the role, out of the actor bias role, out of the narrative that I'm being attacked and going, wow. Tell me about it. What did I just do to trigger you? 
What do you say to that, Coach Menachem? Let's develop it because this is a this is a relationship question. I, I don't. Say, I would guess. say logically it makes sense what you're saying. If somebody can um, be in a bird's eye view and see what's going on, then they might uh, see what you're saying. But when it's happening to the person himself, it, I think it takes a lot of training for them to be able to take a deep breath and say, "What do I feel now?" And then say, "Okay, now what did I hear from Mordechai Weinberger?" Right. So, so let's clarify what you just said on a technical level. And Rabbi Sai, please hold with. This is neuroscience 101, but the basics. So I'm just going to give a little diagram on my face. When we see things through our eyes, two things happen simultaneously. That message goes to our limbic system right in between our brain. And it goes to our frontal, to our cortex, our frontal cortex, the forehead area. And I'll explain what each is. The limbic system is our fight or flight mode or freeze. It's an instinct. So the example that they give is if someone is looking, if someone is walking and there's a snake or an animal comes charging at us within a second or a split second, we have our fight or flight mode kicks in and we run. So we see danger before our thinking process can kick in. What should we do? Is this a safe animal? Is this a garden snake? Is it a poisonous snake? our limbic system fight or flight mode kicks in and we run. It sends emergency to our cortisol and we start getting extra energy that we have. So when we react to our limbic, to our fear system, and we don't allow our thinking process, our seichel hayasha to get in there, we are going to start responding to that woman's question the way she responded. So Coach Menachem, can you read her question again? and listen to that question now from a different point of view. Which part of the brain is being turned on? I have Go a ahead. family member that when I'm around them, I just feel tense and nervous. Bingo. There isn't even yet a logic why. The limbic system, the subconscious or unconscious, is right away in fear mode, panic mode. And as we're going to discuss throughout this program in the second half, we're going to be discussing tools and skills, how to calm it down. The first step is for us to recognize, let's not blame the other person. Let's not get stuck in limbic system mode. Let's try to utilize our frontal cortex. But it's something they're doing. I don't like what they're doing. Let's take some questions. If someone's going to ask and we can start getting in what they're doing. Right now with this question, which is a phenomenal first question for us to realize, we're stuck in trauma mode. Every time I see, I hear Mordechai, it's trauma mode that Ushi loves to bring up. And Coach Menachem, you're always there supporting me going through the process. Trigger right. mode of limbic is very important. Okay, Mordechai, we have a tremendous amount of questions and we have to cover ground. So let's, let's put a little speed on it. Okay, let's take the first live question. You're on. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I have a question about how to handle a person uh, who you feel is gaslighting you. So what I mean by this is when you are around this person, you are not able to maintain or kind of control your own narrative about yourself, which is what you had touched on earlier. You're not able to maintain your own healthy self-esteem around this person because they kind of over time and through different ways, nuanced ways, they're making you kind of feel less than. So how do you kind of advise dealing with a person like that? Phenomenal question. And let's first explain what gaslighting is for those listening. Gaslighting is a term. I don't know if it's a, if it's a, a professional quote unquote term, but it's definitely used all over. And I have Mordecai, seen Mordecai, it's, it's a movie from the 1960s where the husband makes the wife psycho and then they say, oh, she's a mishugana. That's where the term comes from. So exactly. What gaslighting means is that you do normal behaviors and a person has you question yourself. So it's making you doubt, like, are you a good teacher? Are you a good mother? Are you a good father? You're paying the bills and going, yeah, but the other friend brings in so much more. And after a while, you start doubting yourself. Hey, am I even a productive member in society? I'm such a loser and a failure, which comes into another theory we'll discuss later, imposter syndrome, because we want to really more cover ground. So step one to recognize is if someone is gaslighting you, before you can focus on them, before you can challenge them, before you can even discuss it with them, we can't do that. 
unless you yourself create a safe oasis where you can realize you're healthy. So let me share with you a simple concept. The number one therapy for personality disorder out there is called DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy. Do you know that it is a criteria? It is a must. Part of the steps when we were taking, when, I was, when I'm trained in it, is you must, a therapist that works with borderline personality disorder doing DBT must, and I'm saying this three, four times, so I need you to realize this. You must be weekly, if not more often, but minimum weekly in a peer supervision group of other therapists that deal with personality disorders. Why? Because borderline personality disorders will have you doubt yourself. The gaslighting is what happens. I was, several times I could say, I was speaking to a therapist that worked with a certain client and there was a question and the therapist said, you know what, I'll get back to you in an hour. I need to ask my team of therapists, they have a WhatsApp chat, which when we have questions, we could just ask it in between the weekly sessions because I don't wanna make this decision without the group. Why? Because the doubt that will come afterwards is, so they can't discuss in two minutes, I've got this and this client, this is what's going on, this is how they changed the boundaries of the rules, these are the complaints, am I right, am I wrong, should I change it, shouldn't I change it? And when you've got a group consensus, a group support, it helps you stay grounded. So let's take it to you right now. If you're in a relationship that someone is gaslighting you, the first step, the first step is have a support system, have two, three, four friends, or even two best friends. It can be as well as well, I would insist you be at a therapist because that's pretty serious. But make sure you have the support system where you can just share what's going on and not for them to attack the other person that's gaslighting. We don't want to get into the attacking mode. Just saying, you're normal. You're okay. It is normal what you did. It is okay to, let's say, be a mother and to yell at your kids to go to sleep. It's normal to be a mother and one kid says, I don't like your supper. It doesn't mean you don't cook good supper. That's normal. That's what at least one kid will do every single night of the week of making supper. That's just normal. It is normal if you're the father for, for, for your wife to tell you at least once a week, I need more money. At least once a week to say, I don't think you're listening to me. At least once a week to say, you don't know your kids' birthdays? Yes, it is okay for you to forget those stuff. And that is normal. And that is not cool that you're a dysfunctional father, a dysfunctional wife, a dysfunctional child, a dysfunctional parent. This is normal. So the first step is have a support system that you can share your side and just say, you are normal. Step two that I'd recommend is mindfulness. Go walking, no cell phone, no music, no coach Menachem, no Mordechai Warmer, you're nothing. Got to be complete silence, not even music. I know people like music. I don't want music. 10 minutes of utter silence. And if you know how to just do mindfulness, just take a cell phone, take a timer and just five minutes, just breathe in and out. You will be shocked what that does to your brain, the ability to just stay grounded and solid, the gaslighting, all that doubt just stays out of you instead of in you. And hey, Mordecai, we have so many more questions. We, we got I'm sorry for telling you this, but we got to, okay, uh, hi, sorry. You're on? I'm on, yes. Hi, sorry, one second. Hi, sorry, one second. Yeah. Mordecai, you know Coach Menachem, you know Oshie Parnas, you know Arne Echrid. Hi, sorry, is another part of the share. She, she's <laughs> part of it. She's <laughs> always, you. she's got it. Hey, sorry, hit him, hit him hard. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna have to run out of here soon. I, I was gonna say that at what point though do you really feel like you have to just sort of throw in the towel? You might be dealing with somebody that maybe they're too wedded to their defenses, or you know, or even in the case of a psychopath, somebody who really has no guilt or what you know, it's beyond gaslighting. They really could be uh, let's use the word um, abusive. I'm sorry, what did you just say? Let's use the word abusive. Yeah, I will call spade a spade, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I would, I would answer that with a simple question. What's the point that you amputate a body part? That's after you've done everything possible to save your body. You don't want to. And again, I'm referring to- Mordecai, I'm, Mordecai, I'm, I don't want to jump into it, but I did, we did get a bunch of emails. It was on the thing, like four or five emails. I, I have very complex parents, you know, and again, we're going to get into this whole topic, which yeah. you, know, you know, but there's, there is a, there are a bunch of questions. My parents are so abusive. Like, like I'm being told not to talk to the parents. I'm being told to, to discommunicate from the parent when the parent is so, you know, again, I don't know the levels. So first let's recognize what, what Mrs. Cantor has said. So just to clarify, in my mind, I'm referring to a relationship that is immediate family, a spouse, parents, sibling, children, uh, a very close or best friend. 
So you don't want to lose relationships that are that dear and ingrained in our system. So there's a lot of things that can be done. Like amputation is, I don't want to say it's never an option. It's always the last, last, last resort. So after they've done every process of every type of therapy out there, including the Rabbanim, including the alternative therapies, once you've done it all, then, and we need to clarify, there's a difference between amputation and many times in therapy that I use a term quarantine. This is my own term. It's not out there. Where the intention is I need to go into quarantine from that person to build myself up, like from that gas lighting, so this way I can develop who I am, I can develop a shield in front of me that now I can interact with that person. So I'm going to share with you a very quick story, and this is with a client of mine. I'm, I don't want to talk much, but the short version is that every single family member has disconnected from that parent, except my client that was so codependent that just took the abuse and believed that they're the problem, and all the family members that stopped talking to that parent blamed my client. Why aren't you even doing more? So notice that when we're talking about the attribute bias, they disconnect them from their parent, but they blame my client that had a relationship with the parent. Why aren't you doing more? After, and this is about three years of intensive therapy, twice a week therapy, they, are in, they were in group. And I even had them take a separate DBT. So they're going almost four times a week at a time to therapy. They have the best relationship with that personality disorder parent. They are connected, but it's not easy. And it was at times when the parent would make them food and they would like literally spill out their food in front of them in the sink. And then they would come the next day and the parent would go, where's my food? And instead of attacking, go, what do you mean? You just told me you don't like it. And with a smile. No, no, I like your food. She says, oh, you like it, but you spilled out? Yes, say, oh, come on, you're getting so personal? Like, what's the big deal if I spilled it out? But as we help the client and learning the skills, things were able to change. Now, not always. And sometimes, unfortunately, it doesn't work out. But I want you to realize many relationships can change when we change our narrative. Many relationships change when we learn the skills, how to do it, especially when we can laugh not take it personal. And most importantly, what this client has on this, she has created space. Means there are times she would just say, I'm not involved for the next two weeks, guys. I don't care what, yell, curse, scream, but then got involved. So she put herself in self-quarantine, but she was still in therapy. And the intention was, how do I keep a relationship with my parent? It was never disconnecting. It was, I need quarantine. And then sure enough, after the two weeks, the parent bashed them. You idiot, you left me for death, and now you come back? It's like, yeah, I'm here. I just needed a break. What's wrong with you? I don't know. And we taught the evasive skills, evasive responses. But if they don't respond with anger, it changes the whole dynamic. Now, remember, this didn't happen at six months. The this child did not get there at one year or at two years. We're talking about this person has probably invested over $100,000 to get there, but we marry off kids and we're willing to spend that money. Why aren't we willing to invest it in other relationships? It should be standard. Now, I, I, let's not go with the whole concept of therapy has gotta be a much lower price and we gotta get it to great insurance agencies with great therapy where you could get it for free and, co and a copay. I believe we gotta go there just like a great medical doctor. We've gotta get that in Clydesdale, but we're there. We got to the level where we now have great therapists in Clydesdale, which was a desert before. Now we got to figure out how to get the price back down. That's a separate level. But I just want to stay focused on the goal. The goal is amputation and permanent amputation should literally be the last step ever when you've got a therapist and a rub involved. Relationships are able to be worked out. There are, again, cases where it's not, just like every medical diagnosis. Unfortunately, people die from, during surgery. People die from certain diagnoses. And, and personality disorders are one of those that can kill relationships and can kill people now. I'm not, I'm not minimizing that. But we also have to realize that many relationships can work out. So what does Mrs. Cantor say to that, Oshie? Since you're saying she's one of the... No, I think it's great. Yeah, uh, the idea that uh, yeah, it sounds like you just at least allow yourself boundaries or downtime. At least step away and try to look at, you know, 
look at it clearly. It's, it's, it is easier than it sounds, though. I just have to say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That and that's the concept of the book. <laughs> that's the title of the next book, Thriving Around Complicated People. We'll yeah. also be addressing personality disorders that, yes, it is possible, but yeah. you need the support system to thrive. Do you know that this client can now get along in so many different situations mm -hmm. that she was never able to do because she learned the skills how to deal with a complicated parent or a personality disorder parent? Her entire life has been changed because of that. Hey, Mordecai, we have a lot of live more questions. Let's go. Um, you're on. Usha, you're way too quiet for me, by the way. You know, well, I don't know. I'm just, I'm letting, I'm letting the little ones come out. The, the, the hard I'm questions are coming. Get a little Usha going. Everybody who's here now, just letting you know, these are the light questions. We're going to get a little bit more intense soon, so just relax. Just All get, right. get, get in pajamas, get, get yourself a tea. Okay, you're on. <laughs> okay, so basically I have a two-part question. The first part is, how do you heal if you've grown up with a parent that has a personality disorder and is part of the 20% that kills other, uh, hurts everyone else in the way. That's number one. And number two, as you said before, people that are disturbed by a person but that are affected by a person with a personality disorder, um, how do I know if I have? I second guess myself. Maybe I have a personality disorder. How would I know if I do or if I don't? All right, let's take the first, let's take the second one first. The second one is a very easy response and very simple. Ask everyone around you, <laughs> which means as follows. The difference between a complicated person and a personality disorder is that most intimate or close relationships you will have challenges with. A complicated person could be, let's say a husband and wife are having fights and they might even end up in divorce, chas v'shalom. But if that happens, it can be she's a great person, he's a great person, they have great relationships all over, but these two personalities together clash. That is sometimes a complicated relationship or a complicated person. That's only one person that has it with one person. Personality disorder is part of the diagnosis. And I'm actually going to read it from the DSM-5. Those of you watching from other areas, the DSM is the book where we diagnose. It's called the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual. That's what we diagnose from. And the Hagdaman borderline is, I'm just going to read the first sentence, a pervasive pattern means it's pervasive. It's in most areas of instability of interpersonal relationships. So in most places, you're having battles with people that are close to you, not the neighbor in the street five houses down where you just smile. We're talking about people that you're dealing with all the time. If you are having continuous fights with your siblings, with your with your spouse, with your children, with your brothers and sisters. You have a pervasive, means a large time self-image. You're feeling you're horrible. Now, I'm not talking about if you're a child of that because most likely you're gonna feel that. And if you're also having a lot of impulsive, a pervasive instability and impulse, that means you're gonna start cooking two o'clock in the morning. You're gonna start an hour before Shazman is now when you start cleaning. You're a guy that all of a sudden you're supposed to, you get this inspiration about a new business and you're practically changing businesses on this new high and lows, but you're fighting with everyone along the way. So that's what I would ask you, first of all. Do you find yourself fighting with most close people that you have? Not one yeah. or two. That's right. So right away, you can cross that out. You're not a personality disorder. Personality disorders will have, and I, when I'm saying fights, doesn't have to be open fights, could also be as we, like, like as we had before the question of gaslighting, there can be a sitter, as they say in Yiddish. You're in fear around the person. They might not yell. Personality disorders, borderlines might not yell. Narcissists might not yell, especially narcissists. There is this fear when you're around them, who knows what they will do. So step one is, and now if you think about it, I don't, I don't like when people, let's say, always say their mothers, but if you think about the person that you're thinking about, do you see that, do they have challenges with most of their personal relationships? Yes, definitely. That's right. So the easy way to calm everyone down is, do you have a personality disorder? Is very simple. Most, not everyone, but it can't be only one or two. Most close relationships, you're just fighting with them. Okay, Mordecai, <clears throat> let's get into a few other questions. I want to touch this topic because we're getting a lot of texts and questions on this. So I'm going to try to like put two questions together. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. 
Okay, so I think they're similar. It's a little, a little different, but it really goes into how to thrive. Do my siblings and I have a chance of surviving with not a well parent? Question A. Question B, <laughs> this is a great one. I'm trapped between my mother-in-law and my wife who whenever there's a simcha, there's so much crom- drama and craziness. How do I stay positive and I don't stay positive and thrive around such complication? Hold on. I think the second question most men will relate to now. <laughs> But anyhow, let's let's take it on a more serious note. Um, uh, watch that that second question. I guess we're starting with second questions first. Uh, Ushi, let, let's develop it together, Coach Menachem. Let's develop this together. What is the issue? Is the issue that he's married to, let's say, a complicated person, and his mother is healthy, and she, the wife, is just triggered by whatever the mother does? Or is it the other way around? He has a wonderful, sweet, great, caring wife, and the mother is an issue, and she feels extremely threatened that her daughter-in-law is the wife. I'll give one classic example. Someone has once come to me saying, my wife is nuts. She is still insulted that my mother does my laundry. And I look at this guy, long beard, and I go, wait, I don't think I got your question correct. And let me rephrase, and I say long beard, long white beard. So the man is 60 plus. And I go, could you explain to me a question? I said, sure. My wife still gets insulted that my mother does my laundry. I go, how long are you married? He's saying about 40 years. I said, and your mother is how old? She has a good washing machine, Mordechai. Hold on. No, he says, and, and it makes sense once you see the other side. He goes, she's above 75. And I go, so why is she still doing your laundry? And listen to the other side. And she goes, I'm an only child. And my mother lives right next to us. And she wants to feel that she is still young and productive. So the only thing she wants to do is still do my laundry. Why can't my wife get it? Do you see how the whole story just changes when you hear the other side? When we heard this original concept, my mother is controlling. Now, I'm not saying I don't think my mother would want to do my laundry, and I'm not married for 40 years. Uh, but uh, the concept is, why is, what is going on between the mother and between the daughter-in-law? And my job with the husband, I told him, is your wife's not upset about the laundry. It's, is your wife feeling first? Is your wife feeling that she has a special place? And then the question goes Friday night when you come home from shul and I knew the answer. I'd like to, I wish we can do a poll, poll she. Can we do a quick poll? And I'll, I'll give the answer after. Friday night when he comes home from shul, does he first go to his house or does he first go two houses away to his mother's house? Oshie, can we do a quick poll? Let's okay. see from the 600 people that we've got on right now, how many think he goes first to mother and to wife? I have, huh? I, have to, I have to create the poll. That will take me a few it's, minutes. It's okay. Kibidav, isn't it a nice thing what he does? Kibidav aim. Absolutely. Now, can't we do Kibidav aim in a way that our wives and our children will feel that they are as special? That's There's on the way. It's on the way home from shul to go home Let first. Let me ask you: Do you have a kid being jealous when you give your wife attention, Menachem? Coach Menachem. <laughs> They didn't tell me that. And there's enough love that a husband and care can have for a spouse, for parents, and also for children. It is very normal for children to be jealous of one of the other. And that's, again, part of the parent's role to be able to tell this child, I love you and I give you what you need. And I give that kid and I love them and I give them what they need. And the same is what's needed to get between, in this case, mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. It's not and or. It's what's going on over here. I haven't heard yet that any of them are personality disorder. Ushi, I see your eyes. Come on, move on. But uh... how about this one? Whenever I try to point out or mention anything that might be negative about my spouse, they go crazy. I feel like there's something not right here. I wonder if my wife sent that question. My parents (laughs) weren't this way. (laughs) <laughs> Hold on, I gotta check upstairs if my wife sent that one in. Is this there's some personal thing going on? I'm middle sex now. Yeah. <laughs> but on a personal note, um again. Whenever like- you mention anything negative, you want to bring you want to discuss something, they they just get lost. There's no one to talk to. 
So notice what I'm doing now, and then I would like us to repeat all these questions and watch how we're gonna answer it all differently. So I'm right now minimizing everything and putting everything into a normal, healthy husband-wife relationship, which is normal. I came home from work and I had a hard day and also my wife decides now to discuss, so what are we going to buy? Do you know the tuition bills that just came in? Let's go somewhere. I'm like, oh, come on. Do you know I just went through my day? And then all of a sudden the wife is saying, my husband's so sensitive. Well, the other way around, the husband comes home, the wife is busy putting the kids to sleep. And the husband is saying, now I want my personal time. I want a three course dinner. I want it on a plate. After all, everything that's being supported is because of me. Why don't you have time for me? And the wife's going, what are you talking about? The kids are crying this homework. He goes, my wife is so sensitive. So, so far we're putting everything down as a normal healthy relationship. This is normal. And we got to be the mindful, as we mentioned at the beginning, mindful. Oshi, you tell me what, what do you think about all this? Of this question? Yes. Okay. Well, you have to realize there's another, there's another, you know, you, you, you're putting the flame on low. Let's, 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 let's uh, ramp it up a little bit. Let's say you, you're married to somebody and you don't like the way he talks or he says something or the way they act. And you say, oh, can I talk to you about something? And the second you talk to him, he has, let's use the word narcissistic tendencies and he blows his can and there's nobody home how do you deal with that right you need to you need to have a communication sometimes you tell your wife you know thank you very much but sometimes i don't like when you talk like that or when i come home that and you have a conversation what happens the next time i turn to her she blows up so i'd rather just not talk about it so turn let's, up the flame. let's stare up the flame with let's discuss let's go through what uh, the diagnosis i'm going to go through the diagnosis of borderline and narcissist and then we're going to share these same questions through the lens that someone is in a relationship with a borderline. So I am usually extremely hesitant to go through criteria online or publicly because automatically everyone is going to assume that whoever they have a challenge with, as we discussed in the beginning of the program about the attribute bias, that means we see others as the problem, never ourselves. We're always going to see the same thing when we do it. We'll justify, we'll be my head to why we're okay. Okay. They say if you go to the, the basement of Shigayim, the guy who's standing behind the bar says, I'll, everybody out there is totally crazy. What's in Shigayim? <laughs> exactly. So I just want to give an idea of what you need and how it's not that easy to get the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder because you need to have minimum five, not one, not two, not three, not four of them. You might have some traits, but you need minimum five. So let's go. The first one is that they're petrified of being abandoned. Means if they're calling you the entire time, you have to answer every time. And if you or she, let's, let's not use you, you for an example as your wife, but let's just say there's a relationship that you know that the person's petrified that you're going to drop them. They're going to cling on to you and they're going to call you so many times. They're going to start harassing you. And they're going to try the love-hate relationship. Oh, you don't care about me. Yes, I do. Okay, what do you need? Well, you don't answer my call every time. And they'll call you more often. So the first step of that criteria is they are always worried that you're going to drop them. And therefore, they will act in ways of either controlling you, like using the love. You're so special and they keep on buying you stuff. Or the other way around, the negative is that they will then attack you. If you really cared about me, you would answer my calls. So most of the relationship, if you don't answer them right away, they're right away going into that pain. Second part is a pattern of unstable and intensive interpersonal relationships characterized, I'll translate this to simple English, but characterized by alternating between extreme idealization and devaluation. What that second one means is, Ushi, you're the greatest guy I ever met. The minute you do what I want, you, there's never been a person like you. When they go to therapy, you are the best therapist out there. The minute I say, I'm sorry, I just got to cancel today's appointment because I have a family emergency. That's a therapist? You're the worst person. You're abandoning me? You go from idealization, from going, you're the greatest, to devaluation instantly with a simple no, with a simple, I'm not sure how I'm doing. Coach Menachem, have you ever seen these type of things in your life? Now, yes, I, yes, I have. That's right. Now realize it's not just one of them. If someone just has that, that's okay. It could be a fear. It could be someone with anxiety, but the fear of abandonment and they must also have this at all times. Because whenever you give them the good, whenever you say no, you're instantly bad. Now there needs to be a third step. Identity disturbance, markably persistent, unstable self-image and sense of self. 
they're walking around with, I'm really not good. Who am I today? Am I really a from you? Am I really a good person? They might want to change jobs all the time. They might want to be a loud person and a quiet person. They might want to be very from, very not from. They are consistently changing who they are because they don't feel inconsistent. Yes, they are consistently inconsistent in who they are, but as a person. So you see them changing like, whoa, you're different personalities at times. The fourth one, remember, you need five of these. The fourth one is saying impulsive in at least two areas and potentially self-damaging. So they could spend, there sometimes could be drugs, reckless driving, binge eating. In the from worlds, if you'd say it about a woman, I would say it's 20 minutes before this mom, now they're going to try to bake. Everything is calm and all of a sudden it's happening. Three in the morning, they get involved in things. All of a sudden, someone is going from Hatzalah member to Havera member to, to Zaka to all these organizations. But they're not staying stable in it and it's very impulsive. They are acting. They're going to all of a sudden donate to this thing. They're going to start jumping to this yard side, to this caver. It's just not stable. You didn't do this, and now you're doing it, and it's very impulsive. It's in a sudden moment. Remember, it's not one. It's not two. It's not three. I so far mentioned four. So far, imagine the person's got to have all four of these to be diagnosed borderline. The fifth one is reoccurrent. Okay, since we're dealing with adults, suicidal behaviors, gestures, or threats, or self-mutilating behaviors. That is, that because they're in such pain, they would hint to things like, I don't know if I'm going to live. Our, they'll actually try to commit suicide saying, I feel so empty. And they talk about it a lot, or they are actually going to unfortunately try to commit suicide or self-mutilating, which is self-harm, is, is part of the criteria for being diagnosed. Because of their severe pain, they can't handle their body and they can't handle emotional ups and downs. So they would say, Hashem, I don't want to live, but this is part of it. The sixth one is affective instability due to marked reactivity to mood, which means in simple English, they could be in a great mood, and then Ushi is going to go, Mordechai, and all of a sudden, poof, I yell and I blow up. And Ushi, I'm seeing a couple of people that we know as we're doing this are texting me, Mordechai. <laughs> so they're, uh, we'll give a, a, a shout out, yes, to someone that we know very well. And so Coach Menachem, it's the same thing, that I don't control my mood. I can be in a terrible mood, and all of a sudden it goes, Mordechai, like imagine Ushi would say, like he starts the program saying what great speakers you've had and will have. Imagine Ushi goes, Mordechai, you were the most entertaining speaker we had. And I would go from feeling so bad to feel, oh, now I feel great. So it goes from down, can also go up by one word. Ushi, are you going to make me feel good a moment? No. Well, I'm going to say one thing and then we're going to go to a live question because we have so many. Everybody wants to jump on you and attack you. Mordechai oh. Weinberger started Let's Get Real. Mordechai Weinberger was our first guy who came on and because Mordechai Weinberg, we started off with from the best, the top therapist, we were able to catapult to all the 53 other shiurim that we got to. So that's, that is Mordechai Weinberger. So Mordechai should be called, let's get real with Mordechai Weinberger. Okay, let's go to the next live question. Let's go. Should we finish the next three criteria? Go no, to no, questions? no, we got it. Trust me, we got it. Okay, you're on. Um, okay, when you're, when you're dealing with a parent that has a personality disorder, um, are we just supposed to learn how to tolerate them? Because all I really want would be for them to admit it. I don't even care if they change. I just want them to admit it. But um, that doesn't seem really possible. So is, is Notice, it my job just to learn on, how to let's tolerate not, Let's stay on the line. Let's develop this. Notice what you just said. And, and let's really, as a therapist, like let's try, as, as I'm a therapist, to try to understand what you're saying. So notice what you're saying. Let's say there's a personality disorder parent. All you want is for them to admit that, finish the sentence, admit what? That they have an issue. Good. And if they admit they have an issue, then what? You will feel I, what? I guess validated for feeling the way I do. That's right. So notice what the issue over here is. That's what we do in therapy. How can you learn? And that's very much the question that the other person has called earlier, two questions ago which is what's the healing process when someone has a parent that has a personality disorder? And let's understand what that means. Since we went through a large part of the criteria, that means you were raised in a home that there wasn't consistent love. There wasn't a parent that was able to tolerate when a kid cries or complains because they go nuts from hearing the sound and crying. That means when you cried, you were blamed and you might've asked for normal appropriate childhood needs. That means 
that when they have a challenge, they have to blame someone else. They change because they have an in, inconsistent um, stability of self. So they're blaming you or you don't have anything stable. And all you want to know is all the doubts, all the pain, everything that I am going through, just tell me that I'm normal to go through this. So if you tell me you're the issue and you couldn't give this to me, at least I make sense. That's all you're asking for. Your brain is asking to hear, I make sense. Looking for validation. I am normal. I'm good. And I, we, we accept people have challenges. Isn't, doesn't that make sense? Isn't that what you're looking for? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. That's right. And then it would also validate some of your challenges. Like, why are you afraid to fight with people? Why, why are you looking for need for love from other people or from Rabbanim or Rebetzins or from your spouse? Why are you so needy? When you can just have that parent say, I have an illness. I didn't daven for it. I didn't ask for it. But I still have that illness. And therefore, I'm sorry I couldn't give you what you needed. Do you know what that will do for a person? Do you know the healing of the words are, I am sorry? But unfortunately, for a parent to have a personality disorder means they're not able to do that. That's their weakness. They can't see themselves. They are completely blind in this moment to their illness. That's why they need to ever imagine. It's not just one. It's minimum five of what okay, I... Sorry, but could you read the last three? People are texting. I'm sorry for cutting it off. Can you just read quickly the last three? Because people want to know them. I don't see any of them. So read them. I what? shut this... I, I don't see any of the texts. No, no, I know. People, people are just texting that you said five out of the eight. And they oh. want to know what the remaining three were. Oh, Dylan does want to know. Thank yeah, you guys I'm, for I'm, I'm me. cutting you off because I'm familiar, but I, people want to just, just a quicker. Great. So I'll do it a little quicker. Yes, sir. So the next one is, the seventh one is chronic feelings of emptiness. Whatever you give them, whatever you tell them will never be enough. So they're always feeling, so you got to be around them and help them and tell them how good they are 24-7. They'll go, no, I'm really bad. And no, you're really good. And they need to hear literally like a respirator, but you have to do it manually. You can't put a machine. So that is the seventh one. You're always needing to tell them how good they are. The eighth one is inappropriate, intense anger or difficulty controlling anger. That means, let's say I spilled something. And yes, a parent could be annoyed. But what happens when they're shouting, the hitting, the screaming, now, again, we're not talking about someone that's anxious because if someone has anxiety and it's the bad moment of their Arab Shabbos, which is normal when the Sultan wants to get in, that's normal in most houses. Compliment my wife since I was taking, taking swaps at her, but our house is the most calmest house ever, Arab Shabbos, which is amazing. But it's normal for most houses to have that. Here we're talking about inappropriate, intense anger for little normal stuff. That's the eighth one. And the ninth one is transient, translated paranoid ideations of severe dissociative symptoms. It means they're assuming I have huge cheshbonus where people, they're paranoid. People, this one doesn't like me. This one's talking about me. But not paranoia of like people want to kill, kill you. It's more paranoid that everyone is thinking about me. Or unfortunately, the other way, they go to disassociation. They like don't feel themselves. There are times like they yell and scream just so they should feel in their body because they're disassociative. And there's a lot more to that. We're not going to focus on that. So remember, a person needs a minimum five to get the diagnosis of a borderline personality disorder. And if those of you want later, cause Ushi is going to not want me to go through all eight or nine of them for narcissists, but if we'd like, if people ask, we can go through it at a later time. Let's take some more live questions. So this is for okay. the- let's, let's, let's get into more complicated ones a little bit. I think it's yeah. important and we have a lot of texting and a lot of things happening, but I, I think we should cover some of this stuff also. My sister is married to a personality disorder husband and they are in a fight with the whole family. So basically let's take the husband, whatever, you have a, a mishpacha that's, that's married to a personality disorder. And you, I, I've seen this multiple times that, you know, the person is either, I'm never going to that family, some they cut them off, disconnect from them. Do I tell her that she's trapped and her husband is ill or I just let it go? All right. So I will like to answer this person's question with, first of all, let's clarify. You've told your sister many times that her husband is ill. You're not asking this question before you've done it. And let's clarify what has happened is she either got upset at you she stopped talking to you, or together they teamed up against you. So let's understand, telling someone your spouse is ill generally does not work. If you do it once nicely or twice nicely and they're listening, that's okay. But most of the time, they are not listening. So let's get that clear. Now, how do you work with someone when they're under the spell or the influence? 
Number one is you need to realize how dangerous it is to be in that person's house. Imagine you're a wife in a home of a person, of a man, that is, let's say, a narcissist or borderline, that will yell, scream, will throw a fit, can withhold money, can, can yell and scream on such levels that you're petrified that you can't survive now. So if you're going to challenge him, it's only going to get worse, and he might blow up at the kids. So therefore, you are petrified to do anything like that. Do you think it's safe for her to confront her husband? Absolutely not. She's going to need lots of therapy. And when we deal with spouses of personality disorders, we don't tell them, stand up, fight for your rights. They're not ready for that. And the challenges and the pain that's going to come up is terrible. We actually first build them up as a person. How do you start feeling value? How do you start liking yourself? How do you start dealing with all those gaslighting, those doubts? How do you start feeling you're a smart, intelligent person? How do you not take responsibility for that person's stress? So therefore, if you're a family member, you actually want to create your home or yourself to be a safe person for that person to interact with. So let your sister call you up and just share with you the stresses of her daily life. And then she'll venture, gently venture out and tell you, you know what my husband did? And if you go, what an idiot, that's abuse, leave him. It is not going to work. If that's, wow, sister, I feel for you. Yeah, it must be tough. It must be challenging. Would you like to come to us for Shabbos? Can we go out for supper? Can we have an ice cream together? You know, just be open. Can you come to my house? Maybe at least let the kids see what a normal couple, what a normal family is. Maybe let the children have a relationship with a healthy uncle, with a healthy aunt. So the goal is never challenge, never tell them your spouse is a personality disorder, unless you've done it once or twice, because then they're going to disconnect and then they are, they will lose a support system. Because in their mind, they'll now be stuck between my brother and my husband. And most of the time, they're petrified to leave without the appropriate support. So we want you to be a support. Uh, Mordecai, can we quickly go through the, the characteristics of narcissism? Who has asked that? I know you're not doing that it's on your own. Oh, she would not. Somebody leave. very close to me asked. Oh, all right. So the criteria for, as we call it, NPD, Narcissistic Personality Disorder, but I'm going to do it much quicker, Oshie, so help me out. Number one is they got to have a grandiose sense of importance. So they got to say they're great. They're better than Mordechai Weinberger or the, the need for admiration. And let, uh, so, sorry, let's go. Akdama is a pervasive pattern of grandiosity. They believe that they're better, grandiose, either fantasy or behavior. They need admiration. You got to tell them how great they are. There's also a lack of empathy. They don't feel for others, only always about them. This had to start in early adulthood, which means from the teenage years, it doesn't just develop at, at 60. At 60, we start assuming chemicals, medication, other stuff might be affecting them or, or other stuff. But this is, this is the concept. Now that we understand the concept, now let's go to the, to, the, to the nine steps where, again, where you need five out of these. Number one, a grandiose sense of self-importance. So I had a client once that has come in out of work, 40-something years old, and he's telling me him and Reb Chaim Kanievsky are on the same level of tefillah, just the world doesn't recognize him yet. That is the sense of grandiosity, and me with a straight face have to go, wow, can you please give me a bracha? Can I give you a kvittal? If we want to start engaging, we got to start entering that. So not working, no shalom bias, kids don't talk to him. Uh, I don't want to go into the details, but him and Reb Chaim Kanievsky are on the same level. So this is on that level, says so exaggerated achievements, talents, expect to be recognized as superior without commensurating achievements. Means they want to be recognized up here without proving it, without anything. They want to be as wealthy as Bill Gates without having a dollar in their bank account. That's one. The second part is preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, and ideal love. That means all they talk about is power. If I'll be a king, if I'll be president of the United States, if I'll be God Ladar, when I would own this company, do you know what I'll do? All they're talking about is this ideal, perfect, utopian state where they're part of it, but no one else is. That's remember, they not, not one of these. You need minimum five. Third one is believes that he or she is special and unique and can only be understood by or should be associated with people of special and high stature. So again, only Gedolim can relate to them and speak to them. Everyone else, you're just like scum of the earth. I, you should be grateful that I even speak to you and imagine you're married to them. And, and, the, and the statistics are that 80% of narcissists are men. So generally imagine you're a wife with this attitude. The guy doesn't bring panasa. All you have to do is compliment him. He is only understood by everyone and he doesn't have to do anything to even prove why he's there. Fourth one is requires excessive admiration. So you got to compliment this guy 
wow, Reb Chaim Kanievsky must probably send you his kvittel once a year. And he goes, he doesn't, but he should. And you finally get me. Fifth one is, has a sense of entitlement. The entire world should be supporting me. What do you mean Hatzalah raised 12 or $16 million? It should have all gone to me because I am holding up the world more than Hatzalah. This is their sense of entitlement. Everything should be me. Every kibbut should be me without doing anything. Number, that's five. Number six. Number six is an interpersonality exploitive. They take advantage of others. They have no problem taking advantage of you completely. And when you ask them one favor back, are you nuts? You're asking me? Me? Where's the chutzpah? The seventh one is lacks empathy. They're unwilling to recognize or identify with feelings of others need help. How could you be crying now when I'm in pain? You asked me for money because you don't have money for the grocery and you're crying that I yelled at you. How do you ask me such a question? You don't think it's hard for me that we don't have money when I should be a billionaire? So again, they have no room to feel for you when it's all about them. The eighth one is often envious of others that believes and others are envious of him and her. So always so jealous that Reb Chaim Kanievsky has people out there when he knows he's Reb Chaim's level. And he believes that everyone's jealous of him. I mean, Nabuch. And the last one shows arrogant, haughty behaviors or attitudes. They are walking around with this haughty concept. Remember, you need five out of nine, not one or two. Every one of us has one or two. That's healthy. That's normal. It might even be called the self-esteem. That gives us the ability to grow five of these all together in one person. Now that's painful. That's an illness. That is not a, that is yeah, not an I'm going to have to listen to the recording with, uh, to get all this information to see. Um, where How many going. of those you have, Coach Menachem? I know you well. You're okay. You, you got nothing. You got here's nothing. A, here's yeah. a, uh, there's, while we're talking over, you have to understand there are parents and kids that disconnect because of whatever reason, blaming others or the therapists. And here's a question. What do you do when your child is married to personality disorder? So this is a question from a parent and uh, their child stopped talking to them. What would, it, what would you tell a parent to do in that case? I have been involved in many such stories and I'd like to share with you the secrets that work. So as we know, Sheikhed, if you bribe someone, it's Yavir, Seni Chachamen, Mordecai, Mordecai, somebody texted those Trump have at least five of those. Okay, continue. <laughs> <laughs> I will hold back my comment from that. So let us go now to, uh, to this question. So how do you work with that? Number one, realize that if you had a wonderful daughter and she fell in, let's say, with a narcissist, she's now stuck between a husband and between parents. Or the other way around, if someone is your son and she now he now married someone that's got a, a personality disorder, he is stuck. You might have raised him so well that you taught him that marriage comes ahead of everything, and therefore he is now choosing to keep a marriage working. Unfortunately, when someone makes you choose between two or three people, it does not make the marriage work. Now, let me take a step further that part of our job as parents is to be able to teach our children when to say no to abuse, no to terrorists no to pain. And that is the first step in there. I should say it's probably the third or fourth step when someone's married to a personality disorder is how to disagree with them gently and lovingly. And even though they throw a fit to stay again in your calm sense of empowerment. So therefore, if you have a child now that feels torn between a parent and between their spouse, the first step that I'd like you to realize is that your child's going to go through many years of a journey to get to a healthy place for that marriage to work out. You don't want to be the one causing him extra pain. So the loving position would be that you would tell your son or your daughter is, look, Shaifala, I love you so much. I understand there's an issue with your husband or your wife doesn't want to come here, doesn't want you to interact with me. Just know I'm here for you whenever you want. That's okay. Step one. Step two is if you can call up the son-in-law and daughter-in-law and say, I want you to know my house is completely yours. Whatever you'd like, I'll do. Now, it's not enabling in a way where you're giving in. You're just having a healthy relationship because you want to be able to model to your child that it's healthy in your marriage when you sometimes say no, which will give your kid the permission. looks like they lost the skill or they didn't develop the muscles yet how to say no to a spouse because it is extremely important in a marriage to set boundaries. 
So therefore, your goal is let your spouse be close to you. It might take them 10 years. Don't challenge. Do not. The biggest mistake that you will make is to put your son-in-law and daughter-in-law in their place because your spouse, because your child couldn't do that. That's not your place. Do not leave magazines out there to read. If you're married to a personality disorder, I've heard all these things. I had a great story where someone was doing Shalom Bias and he wanted to give his wife, his wife loves reading psychology. So he bought her 10 books from Ravik de Miller on how to improve your marriage. And she goes, what do you think? How do you think she accepted those 10 books? My crazy husband. Had he gotten her build self-esteem, all that stuff. And then how do you build 10 steps to build your marriage? She might have read it. But instead, 10 books on build your marriage, respect your husband. And he's got so many of those wonderful books. It didn't work out. So again, I am not saying to become an enabler. That's your daughter's position to learn or son's position how to get out of. What I am saying is the more they're connected to you, the more there's love, the more she has a support system. When she wakes up, she can finally say, okay, now I am willing to take the step. It's okay. not easy. You're going to be in therapy. You're going to need a support system for that because you're going to be triggered. Okay, heavy information. Here's another interesting question. What do you do when your children are in the trap of an ex-wife and everyone, see, everyone sees it, it's pretty clear, the school, the friend, the family, everybody sees it, but the kids just don't see it. So let's explain attachment theory a little bit and we'll try to go there as quick as possible. Attachment theory is a concept that children are going to need and want the attachment of a parent or of a significant caregiver. The greatest trauma or pain that a parent can do to a child is withhold love. These personality disorders, the way they are keeping their children still ingrained, a trap is by giving love and then withdrawing love. That's how, that's how addiction works. That's how the casinos work. They make sure you win, but enough that you're going to come back. But if you win too much, then they lose money and then that got to be open. So they make sure you lose most of the time. The system is stacked against us, but they make sure you win enough to keep on coming. When someone Ebuch has got a severe personality disorder and they are so ill that they are damaging their children, they are going to give enough love for the child to feel, oh, that's what I need. Oh, that's my respirator. I need it. And then just when they're getting enough, poof, they're going to withdraw. And now the child, like a magnet, is going to come back. And this is the same thing when people are in abusive workforces, where the boss tells them, you know, you did pretty well. So this could be their number one salesman. They go, you know, you did pretty well this year, but last year you even did better. They make sure not to compliment you because you're looking for a great compliment. You're looking to feel good. They're going to give you a whack on your head to keep you attached, to keep you trapped. And the challenge, the way you help the kid is with consistently you having healthy interactions with them. You don't fall for the trap. You don't fall into that, okay, well, now buy me off. Well, mommy said this or Tati said that. It's, Shaypal, I love you, my wonderful kid. Here's bedtime. Here's where we do this process. I like mommy. Good, stay by her. But when you come here, there's stability. Do not let them play the splitting game. That is the worst things that can be done. Wow, okay. We have a lot more questions, Mordecai. We have all night. It's like, you know, it's like, what do we find bring? Like friends. Okay, let's go live. You're on. Yeah, you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, good. So I wanted to thank you for this talk. It's really something that I relate to. I'm sure many people do. Um, I have a question. Is there, like, is it possible to create a kinder and more loving approach or awareness towards people with personality disorders? Like I hear people saying, he's so borderline, she's so borderline, I had to deal with a personality disorder. Like, I understand that they're not, that they need help and they could be sometimes violent or they could be, um, you know, just not healthy, but isn't it more effective to, instead of labeling them and being condescending to develop, to say that they're hurting? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, we're not excusing what they're doing, but if we're annoyed, they're 10 times more in pain. I just feel that, you know, a kinder and more gentle approach, not not validating, not I mean not saying that they're right, but a kinder, gentler approach might, you know, I don't know, I feel is more effective rather than kind of sending and putting them down and labeling. Um, yeah. 
So I first want to agree with you. Not only do I want to agree with you, that is the solution. The entire method of therapy when you're dealing with a personality disorder is you first need to label it because you need to understand that they're working from a place of pain. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense, their behaviors. No mother or father or brother or sister or child acts like that. You might have many children, and why is this one child causing so much problems? Fighting, arguing, you have a Pesach Seder, and they're nonstop blowing, and half the Seder, everyone's worried ahead of time, and family members don't want to come to your Pesach Seder or to your Sukkah, or they don't want to come to a wedding because this child, this child is going to make a problem. So we first need to label it to understand that this is an illness, this is a challenge, and it's not healthy. The next step, the way we do it is we actually give them empathy. That's exactly how we help everyone around, saying the person's not bad, the person's in pain. And now we're going to teach you the skills, how to stay safe, that even though they're in pain, let, let me ask you something, let's say this person's in pain, but you get slapped, and you get slapped again, and then you get slapped a fifth time you're going to get angry. So what we're doing is we're teaching you the person that's slapping you is in pain and isn't well. And you're going to give them a lot of love and care, but you're going to learn how to protect yourself not to get slapped. You're not going to hit back, but we're going to teach you how to defend yourself as well. So do you realize that what you said is the secret? The number, the number one step is stop looking at the person as a healthy person. Recognize they have a diagnosis, they have an illness. And when they act and when they hit you, if it's someone that's violent and wanting to hurt you, then you might hit back. Here it's no, just protect yourself. And now how can we respond with love? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. That is the point of the book. So as I'm sharing with everyone, I am three quarters done with my book called Thriving Around Complicated People. And that is the concept. The concept is look at them as either ill, look at them as it might be you triggering it, Look at it is that when you create that safe oasis, that safe place for you, that island where you're calm, then you are able to interact, then you are able to connect with them, then you are able to create a relationship with them. As I shared with my client that has been over th for three years with many multiple therapy modalities at one time so they could interact with a very complicated person, parent, which most of their siblings completely has disconnected. So yes, we can teach it. And your attitude, your view is the solution. We don't look at them as evil. We don't look at them as bad. We look at them as in pain. But unfortunately, when sometimes people are in pain, they just keep it to themselves. When someone's a personality disorder, they actually attack. And that's why it's so much harder to have empathy and sympathy. And that's why usually they're in a support if they're, if they're a family member. If let's say it's a brother, that's a, support, that's a personality disorder. You'll have to be in a support group because you need that as well, besides for the therapy. You need continuous reminders. We also have where people write certain note tags. When I speak to my brother ahead of time, know that they're going to comment, and I'll just take a deep breath. Smile back, no matter what. There are so many skills. We didn't even get to the skills and how you respond. We're still dealing with the beginning stages. But so many of those points are what we do. We actually have you, let's say, write a paper. Smile back. When they attack you, go, oh, I'm so sorry. Learn how to take it. Learn how to just go, wow, I really see that I hurt you. It changes the whole dynamic. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, Mordecai, this email came in literally 20 minutes ago during the share. It's a great question. You ready? Uh-oh, you're smiling. That puts oh, I'm smiling because I think it's like we didn't, we didn't even think about this. I hear of people getting divorced because of personality disorders, such as being narcissistic, borderline, all these different disorders. How could you find out this before getting married? Is there a way to tell while dating? Are there some personality disorders only known once married, how could you spot the signs before? Woo, tough one. Well, let's make it very simple. Realize what personality disorders diagnoses are. In one concept is they're emotionally unstable, ups and downs. We know, we all have, I mean, we all, but many of us have either brothers, siblings, children that are six, seven, eight years old. And you see, let's even take younger, let's take up to six where you give them the lolly and they're smiling. You're the best Tati in the world. You tell them bedtime, I hate you and I don't want to go to sleep. Of course, if you have no, if you have great parenting skills, that doesn't happen. But let's just take classic. They want something. That emotional up and down is appropriate for six. It's not appropriate for 17, 18. If you ask the friends, question number one, if it's let's say asking information about a boy or a girl, how are they, how are they with friends? Do they get 
angry at friends? It's a very detailed question. They don't like people, boys and girls, do not like getting these questions when they're asking about other people. But the first question would be, how are they emotionally? Do they get into fights with people? First question, or are they respect and loved by all? It's going to be a hard one for a guy to get out of. Next one is, do they have people, do they have close friends? Who are their three, four best friends? People that have personality disorders are the signs of that do not have best friends. If it's a boy, do they have chavrusas? When you hear this bachel learns alone, doesn't have chavrusas, major warning signs. Next one is, when they have a disagreement with someone, how does it usually end? Like, if it's a good friend, did you ever disagree with them? How is it? Do they make you feel horrible? Or, like, do you guys work it out? Do they ever admit that they're wrong? Very simple, emotional questions. But people that have got the tendencies for personality disorders will have a very, very hard time. And you're right away going to smell from their person's response. Yeah, yeah, he's like everyone else. He gets into fights sometimes. And does he apologize? Yeah, you, know, you, you don't hear the sure. Yeah, he's a kind guy. So when you ask these emotional questions, very detailed questions, it helps out. And you can right away get a feel for the person. And Mordecai, I just want to let you know we have a lot more um, go ahead. disorders to cover. And we have a lot of live questions. So go. Okay. Shoot. Okay, let's go to the next live question. You are on. Hi, thank you so much. So to sort of piggyback on what you've been discussing, so you want to find red flags or you see things that are, you know, maybe you're dating somebody and end up then mirroring that person because maybe you didn't see the red flags or you weren't aware of them. And now you're married to a narcissistic person, whether it's the guy, whether it's the girl, it doesn't matter. My question is to you, how often does it happen that somebody in a narcissistic marriage where the person may quote unquote change? The narcissist, how, do, do they ever change? Can they change? How do they change? What are the chances? And, and then if the spouse who's not the narcissistic one, you know, so they change their perspective or they, you know, work on themselves to, to sort of stay in there, but then their kids are seeing um, the role model of one narcissistic parent. So all those things, like, what's your thoughts on all that? Well, How's that for a calm well, question? That is fully loaded. So let's take this one, the first one first, and then we'll go to the second one. I'd like help from Ushi and from Coach Menachem to both, um, I should say, monitor if my word comes out almost like we're blaming the healthy person, because I don't want to do that. So let's recognize... The challenge of a personality disorder is that they will very most likely not go for help until they're not functioning well. That means they'll still continue to be unhealthy because that was the pattern that they were under until the system doesn't enable them to continue, which means, unfortunately, it takes the healthy spouse to change the dance. Now, I'm not blaming, remember, and that's why I need Oshi and Coach Menachem, that you don't feel attacked by me saying it's your fault. It's not your fault. There are the three C's that I love that they use in addiction that I use to personality disorders. You didn't cause it. You cannot control it. You can't control what that personality disorders person can do. And you also can't cure it. But there is part that you can do to control, and there is part that you can do to cure. And that is by you changing the dance. The way I have seen personality disorders go for help is when we stop enabling because they need to feed off someone. A personality disorder is almost like a disease of relationships. Like think of, let's say, like in medical terms, like if someone's got an infection or a virus and they're around someone, you just caught the virus. In order for them to continue their abusive behavior or their ill behavior, they need another person that's going to be dancing along. When you change the dance, it doesn't bounce. Ushi and Coach Menachem, can you both tell me, and I'm going to ask you, Speaker, it doesn't sound like I'm blaming the healthy person, because I'm not. Does it sound like they're blaming, that they're being blamed? Well, the first thing you're saying is that they could be helped. The question is only how. How do we get them to the help? And it, it is a lot that depends on the healthy person. Yes. Well, right, but it sounds to me like you're saying that the healthy person does have some control over the situation. So can we do a role play, Oshie? I'd like to do a role play with you, and I'd like the caller stay on the line because I want you to hear how it's going to go. 
So, Ushi, I would like you to blame me for um, drinking water instead of tea in this hot cup. Like, what normal person would put cool water in a hot cup? Mordechai, um, you know those hot cups cost about $4 a package. Why are you drinking water out of the hot cup? They have plastic cups. Did everyone notice I just got attacked for that, which the personality disorder will attack you. Now, I could A, watch this. I'm going to explain myself. I'm so sorry, Yoshi, but I actually had a tea here first. But then I put in water because I ran out of tea and I'm doing this program. So I just put in cool water, but I'm so sorry. How Don't, would do, you that. Know? Don't do that again, okay? Okay. So notice what happened. I just gave him power. I apologized. Now will she do that again? Just don't do that again. What shouldn't I do again? Just don't use water, the cups. Don't give me all the excuses. Just don't use it. Figure it out. I hear you. What are you going to do now? I'm going to go upstairs and beat you up. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But I want, to, I want to develop it how... We, go, we use evasive answers. I hear you. I'll try next time. And you go right ahead doing it. What yeah, happens is- I want to clarify, I to explain, maybe I can explain a little bit clear to her. There's, there's, it's, not, it's not the healthy person, it's not in their control, but there is in their control how to for themselves to be healthy, what they need to do. At the same time, if you do the wrong things, you're not, not only not helping, you're actually enabling. So the more you give in and the more you say, you're right, and then you, you let yourself get abused by the person, you're you're making their um, their algae of their plant. You're giving them more more you know more of that chemical to get bigger and bigger. You need to take away that that thriving back and forth push and pull part of the of the relationship. And the minute again, and in front of them, you can actually pour more water. So watch this. So Ushi, so I'm right now pouring more water and act like the personality disorder. What will you say? Just told you something. Why are you doing that again? Oh, you're right. You did say that. I hear you. Thanks. I'll, I'll Every think time you do this, you get me so upset. I, think I know. I'll, I'll try not to do that next time. I hear you. I end up in the hospital, you should just know it's your fault. You got, okay. it. you got it. And I'll also say, Kelma Rahman. I'll make sure I'll be the first woman to say, Kelma Rahman at the Levi. Like, you can go with it. You're not challenging. You're just staying calm. You're gaslighting me. <laughs> but that, that sounds like great in a webinar, in a workshop, in a role play. But in day to day, and then what happens if they get screamed and yelled at? And then there's Watch, the tons of let's do this. yell at me. Watch how I'm going to react. No, and I want you to realize, first of all, before just to clarify, you're 100% correct. If anyone is married to a personality disorder, I want to be very clear. You're going to be one, two, probably three years in therapy once a week. You're going to be going to a group, a support group, one, two, and probably three years as well. You might be going to one or two different modalities helping you. You cannot expect to be involved a certain with a, with a real diagnosis, which is very attacking, very condescending, emotionally exploitive, and emotionally volatile. That is this diagnosis. You can't have that expectation. They're right. This webinar is not meant to teach you how to do it. This webinar and the point of my book, Thriving Around Complicated People, is to teach you all the skills that we do in a very fun, readable way that makes it normal. But you now have the knowledge. Yeah, now go this, ahead and start. Yeah, let's, let's just clarify. This is years of work. And I don't know if there's a diagnosis for the people that are involved with such people, but they themselves have to, they have, to have their own support and their own, you know, I don't, I don't know if they have a diagnosis, but it's... It's we like, use the term, most of the time we use the term codependency. codependency. Like Latoma, Ashley, Latoma, you know what I mean? That's right. So watch this. If you yell at me for screaming, part of the therapy would be to learn how to just walk to another room and go, you know, when you calm down, I'm in that room. Gently, calmly, without anger. You're not getting into their energy. They need a volatile energy. The goal of the therapy is to teach you how to stay in that calm level. And as you get there, they change. How do you think, what do you think is the therapy for them? And that's exactly the method of therapy. They come into the therapist, you're a horrible person. And right away, the therapist takes out a skill saying, great, let's write down five reasons why I'm horrible. Now let's write down the other way, five reasons why I'm a great person. It's all skill-based, you crazy person. No, do the skill. They don't, the DBT system is a lot less talking and a lot more, let's work on a skill. Hey, Mordecai, let's go to the next live question, okay? Yeah, go ahead. You're on. You're on. Okay, so basically what you just said actually leads into the question that I had. 
my question was, is it ever possible that someone's diagnosis is bad mediocitis? And I don't say that jokingly. Um, in a real abusive situation, your example with the cup would end up not in a back and forth conversation, but that's it. You don't get to go shopping anymore because you waste money on cups. It's not so simple when the goal of the other person is to put you down. So if you learn how to handle um, abuse A calmly, you will encounter abuse B because the goal of that other person is different than, it's not a power of goal. So again, back to my question, isn't it possible that sometimes the diagnosis is bad mediocitis? So let's take a step back and you use this cute word, bad mediocitis. So if something is medos, then we go to a rav. Personality disorders, and I'll get to that in a minute, rabbanim sent to therapists. So bad medos, you take a safer. When it's an illness, you go to a therapist. And this is across the board why rabbanim send people to therapists. So let's first clarify. What issue, what you're discussing is not, not bad medos anymore. Bad medos is you take mesil sisharim. Bad medos is you take chayvus alvavus. Bad medos is you take arthur sadigim. Bad medos is you take reb shleim of that's not the diagnosis. That's why we went through the criteria of personality disorders. You need minimum five of them. Five of them makes it an illness. Bad midos is anger, is cost. And this is not me asking to any one of your rabbanim. That's how they clarify. That's where rabbanim send people to therapists. Because if it's midos, they tell you to take out a safer. Is that clear first step one? Then we can go, what you said is a great second point. When you set your boundary that, to the drinking water, the person's going to act out and get worse. But let's deal with one at one. Do you understand the difference between bad midos and between a mental disorder? Anxiety is not a chasar in emunah and betachen. Very different. Every rub will tell that to you. They first deal with emunah and betachen. If you're still having fears, they send you to a therapist. Remember, could a guy that doesn't understand emunah and betachen help people with anxiety? Yet a certain skill it does because they don't have emunah and betachen. It's a illness. A pill. You take the pill. If you have bad midos, it won't give you a moon and betachem, but it will help you if you have anxiety. Let's clarify. Bad midos and illness are very different. So just tell me if you agree or disagree. So now that I'm unmuted, <laughs> yes, um, it, I'm saying that the person who has bad midositis is not taking out a mustard safer. The other person, you're, you're trying to empower the other person, right? So I'm saying that some of the techniques which would in a normal situation put an end to the problem, if the other person's goal is to upset you for what, because of whatever issues they have, whatever power they feel when you're down, then they'll just up the ante and, you'll, and it won't be something that you could just talk about. Beautiful, that is why, notice we said therapy for the healthy spouse till it changes is one, two, three years of therapy. Groups, one, two, three years, why? That's the point. They will raise the ante. That's why we don't teach spouses right away, put up a fight. We first got to get you strong enough to handle the challenge. Most of the time we deal with a spouse where they're completely broken down. They don't have a self-esteem. They're afraid. We have to deal with all the fears. What's the worst thing you're worried your spouse is going to do? We got to get you strong enough. And that's six months to a year of therapy where people sometimes will not see any changes, but really us, the therapists with the client, we are laying the foundation that when you are going to set the boundaries, when you are going to start using the evasive responses, you should be strong enough because we know how they're going to raise the ante. We know how they're going to respond. And that's the goal of therapy. So again, you're asking a great question, but this is a webinar explaining to you the process. You want to get to three years of therapy and support and groups and all that at the first half hour. It doesn't work that way. Mordecai, I want to cover more ground over here because uh, there's still a lot of topics we didn't cover, okay? Go ahead. I'm going to read you three questions, okay? Go ahead. I feel like I'm just not making it. I, can't, my, I feel like I'm just not making it. My, I can't keep my job, and my wife is always telling me how it's always all my fault. I feel so lost and depleted. Question one. Question two. My mother has BPD, and I constantly find myself trying to please her tiptoe around her moods. Whatever I do is not enough. I know I make myself crazy and I like to do it. I should do it more because of Kibidava Aim. Question three, I do anything my mother wants because I need her to like me, even at the expense of ruining my relationship, work, personal life. What could I do about it? 
Beautiful. All three of them. Number one, just not making it. Number two, a mother that's a personality disorder. And number three, similar, wanting to just be liked and just trying to get liked. The martyr, the martyr, the martyr. The, 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 the martyr. person we said before that one sibling talks to the mother and gets the clap from everybody. Right. Notice the core. And that's going to answer to all the questions that we had before about the, you know, about married to a spouse and things like that. You first got to fill yourself up. And if those of you tuning in now that missed at the beginning, let me just say it again. Very important, therapists that do DBT, that work with personality disorders, must go once a week to group to keep yourself sane. That means you're all looking for love. When you have a parent or a spouse, because a normal relationship, this is the most intimate personal relationship of attachment, is a relationship of children to parents, husband to wife, and again, they're giving it to their children. When you're not getting that and you're being attacked, your core is on empty. Of course, you're just not making it and you're feeling lost. The goal that we do in therapy the first six months is not about how to deal with the other person. It's how do we develop a human? We're literally Machaya Mason. Who are you? What do you like doing? How do you take a break? How do you breathe? How do you start feeling alive? How do we build you up as a human? We're not even challenging yet the other person. How do we challenge those thoughts? We haven't even gone at all into the cognitive ways of distorting, of challenging the thoughts of when, and I've got that in the book, when someone tells you, oh, you're a failure. Let's say like the husband, whatever he's doing is just not making enough. And the wife complains. There are cognitive CBT methods, how you challenge the thought. Is that true? That's one way. Another way is how would you compare it to others? If another one brings in the same amount of Parnassus, does he get bashed? No. What would you tell someone? Would you ever speak that way? There are four or five cognitive skills that we train the person first, how to deflect the tax, the shield, and how to build yourself up with love and, ful and fulfilling fulfillment. The challenge is most of you asking the questions want the instant answer. You want the answer how to get there in 30 seconds or less. And it's, it's therapy, it's support, it's having groups, it's when you're in doubt. It's writing yourself love letters. You're great. If you're a man putting in your film, I know you're coming to shul now and your wife probably complained. Are you going around guilt? How could you leave in the morning and not put the kids on the bus? but your job is to go to shul and you're good for doing that. And Hashem is so happy that you just chose shul and doing your role. And the same thing for the wife. I think before, before we end, uh, maybe we can start a little with uh, skills. Like the question over here. So I'm basically hearing somebody's admitting that I'm BPD. What can I do to get better? And then it says, I've done all the therapy from many different angles and all different approaches, and it is what it is. Now what? What else can I do? So what I'll tell you is it isn't what it is. It is what you've just made it. Therapy works. DBT works for borderline. There is another method for, um, for narcissism. It just slipped my mind. It'll come to me in a couple of minutes. Those systems work. It's hard to do the work. It's hard to work the work. Any addict can, re can resonate with the challenges that you have. I'll probably say healing, you know, personality disorder might be just as challenging. It depends, again, the intensity, just like every addiction, every illness has that. It is possible to get better and do the therapy, work the work, make the commitment. I've seen it. Ushi has seen it. Coach Menachem has seen it. You guys all know about similar people that I'm thinking about, and they have healed, and they're growing. And it's still a challenge, and they're still in therapy, but they're having productive lives, having productive marriages. It is possible. Do it. Now realize... Many people like doing a skill on their own. Were you in therapy? Are you in group? Like DBT must be group as well as individual therapy and sometimes individual therapy twice a week. More than that, there's an IOP, intensive outpatient program specifically for personality disorders. That's minimum three months to nine months. I know someone that has done it twice. Nine months, that's seven hours or six hours a day of group and individual therapy for the borderline personality disorder. But you know what? They are healed. They're healthy. And how do you know they're healed? You go through the criteria and they don't meet not even five, not even four, not even three of them. And they're still in therapy, but you can heal and you might need stronger work. Yes. Okay, Mordecai, there's two more questions I want to cover because it's late. We're going past our uh, limits, but I feel they're both, they're both important. Uh, it's a few questions combined. People are texting them. Um, let's cover two more, then we'll go to closing. Does that work for you? Okay. You got it, Here we go. I just want to cover this topic because we didn't touch it, but we got so many questions about in that vicinity. Um, this is the basic question. It's very hard for me to go to my parents for Shabbos. Everything needs to be neat and put in order. Take their shoes. Be quiet. It's constant stress of not doing something 
wrong. How do I manage with that type of parent? Phenomenal. So the first step that we do is, can you think in, in gray terms instead of black and white? So imagine, Oshi, if you would have such a parent, you might choose to go all week, stay there for Pesach, an eight-day yantiv, or you can choose to go, hey, how about I just go there for one meal? Now we start thinking in terms of gray, instead of I go there a whole time or I don't go at all, gray areas. How can I go there on a Friday? How can I be there on a Matzah Shabbos Malava Malka? It doesn't have to be all or nothing. We're not here to change our parents. And chances are they're not going to change just because of you, especially if you're threatened. But it is more likely that they'll be willing to listen if there's gray areas. And they go, why don't you come more? And you could say very clearly why. You know, it's stressful. You know what? Things have to be so structured. It's hard for me to be there that long. So you're just real. Part of the dialectical behavioral therapy is actually being real with a person in a gentle, loving manner. Hey, Mordecai, let's end with this question, and then we'll go to closing, okay? You ready for the closing? Go ahead. The last question of the night. What can I tell myself? I have somebody in my life I can't get rid of. They're negative. They pass the blame to everybody else besides themselves. This person has so many diagnoses, I'm not going to even get into it. I honestly don't even care. But the problem is they managed to get into my head and taking up all the rent in my head. They have free rent in my head. Please help me to clear myself and to thrive. Wonderful. So I'm going to share with you a concept that cognitive behavioral therapy uses and dialectical behavioral th therapy uses. And Coach Menachem is huge into this. And there's a term called mindfulness. Mindfulness means as follows. And we'll just explain it in short. Our mind at all times thinks has thousands of messages going on. We have the choice of what to focus on. We could focus on the positive, the negative, both at the same time, or different emotions, just like we know that if someone is at a Levaya, they yarshin a lot of money, they make the bracha of dianoimus, and they also make the bracha of they, they got something great. They make two brachas at the same time. You can have a sad emotion and a great emotion. Now let's look at the other way. Same as with our thoughts. What mindfulness is an exercise of just focus on your breathing, for an example, in and out. Watch, you can even do it now for literally 10 seconds. Just close your eyes. You can do it with your eyes open. Just inhale and notice the breathing, the breath in. Is it longer, deeper, and then exhale? It's literally 10 seconds. So if you guys would time it, just inhale and exhale. And just pay attention to the breath. Inhale and exhale, you'll automatically come back after that. While you're doing it, you won't feel a thing, but after that, you'll feel calmer. Why? Because you got your mind focusing on something. So mindfulness does not work instant. It's not magic, but it's with exercise, with practice and skill, you teach your mind to focus on something. So there's mindfulness of putting a little water in your mouth. There's mindfulness on touch. And as you get your mind focused and you practice your mind to start focusing on one thought, not thinking all over, which is again, people that are around a borderline environment, they're taught to think about everything and think what can get the borderline upset and how to avoid the personality from getting upset. We wanna go simple, think simple, make simple mistakes, say a sorry, continue doing it, be clear, that is the goal. So that is the goal that I would like to help everyone to recognize the number one skill for that is mindfulness, training every day five minutes, and maybe Coach Menachem can share one or two skills on how you do it, if you would like, about practicing and focusing your mind. Again, it needs to be practiced. We need to realize, are you having it because of the environment? So therefore, you also need help how to deal with the environment. You might need to learn some skills, how to shield yourself from the negative comments, and in your mind, how to respond, but not to respond to that person about it. So mindfulness is definitely the ways that we train our mind how to have peace. Mordechai, unbelievable, powerful, powerful share. And I, I feel like we barely touched it. <clears throat> I just want to read one thing that one of the listeners wrote over here. I have two friends who used to meet the criteria for BPD and both of them, after years of group, DBT and individual therapy, now do not meet that criteria anymore and are BPD free. So I just wanted to give some chizik for that. So there, there is well. Okay, let's go to closing. Mordechai, here we go. Again, a great shashkar to Mordechai Weinberger, a very close friend of mine, and Menachem for coming on tonight, giving us so much chizik. Our uh, founding fathers of Let's Get Real, who came back now 54 weeks later, is a little bit different. It's a little bit different now than it was uh, 54. Yeah, it's a little, no. It's a little, you know. Give it, give it to him. He wants it. 
He wants, he wants it. Let's get it. Let's see. Let's see and coach. Feed my narcissism. Feed my narcissism. You didn't do you it. You got it. You guys are so natural. You've got so many listeners. You've got, you're making an impact. The ability that both of you are so comfortable with speaking with Gedolim, Rabbanim, top therapists, the ability in which you've grown. You guys are popular. You go in the street and people are stopping you and you guys are still humble. Is really amazing. I knew you before Coach Menachem and Oshi Barnes, and I know you now. It'll be nice to know you a couple of years from now as well. And you're just the same guy. I mean, we got our Noyach on the line again. And just as humble, you know, with all this covet of helping all this. And you guys are just phenomenal. And me I was... Me and Rebchaim. Yeah, exactly. And to add on that you've had G'daylum, that people that like, I, I dream to just speak to them and you spend hours with them and you speak to them ahead of time. And they feel so close with you guys, and you're just natural about it. What a growth. And the ability to help call your soul with what you're doing, reaching so many different places, different platforms. It is a pure siyata deshmaya. It is a pure skill and talent that both of you have within you. And people all saw that within you guys. It's just nice to see it in fruition. That's right. Baruch Hashem. So, Mordechai, you're always welcome back anytime you want. Please come back. We love you. You're the best. We all know that. Best therapist in the world, I, for sure. From all fifty-four, you're probably the best. I'm not whatever. I don't want to say Barab. I don't want them to, to come back. Okay, again for all the first timers over here again tonight, every Sunday night. This Zoom ID at 10 p.m. Yes, it's late. That's what time we do it. Is uh, share. We have great people and we have a tremendous program coming up. Um, again, the next program will next next week is Sunday night Shua, so we're not going to have a program. But uh, asked my brother if I could do it on Shua, he said no. But the, the, the following Sunday, 523, is going to be Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson. It's going to be a very powerful program. We're going to be discussing life after divorce. It's going to be talking about, you know, so many different topics in that. It's, it's going to be very powerful. And uh, if you know anybody who's happily married, you should definitely join just to, you can know what people go through and you can be mechazic them to understand from that point of view. If your marriage is struggling and you're thinking about divorce, you're definitely going to watch that share because you're definitely going to, definitely going to be, try much harder to work on it. And if you went through the parasha, you are you're going to want to be on. It's going to be really powerful. I've been getting hundreds of emails already, hundreds from all different angles. Um, so we're going to get into that, Mitchem. Please let people know about it. Again, tonight's share is being learned. Daniel, who's the yard site, was this past Shabbos. And Yehuda Kranzer, who was this past Thursday, Nifta, I think it was the middle of learning, actually, Daf Yomi. Young guy, he was 46, 47 years old. He left over six children from Detroit. So she have a great salia. Also, Zecha Nishmas, Mordechai Weinberger's father, Daniel, Yoyne Elimelech, Yosef Ben Rabdavid, Arna Yachfried's mother, Chai Leah, Bas Rabdavid, and uh, all the Shama Shem and Leah, and uh, thousands of people, you know, were on tonight. Thousands of people will watch it. And, uh, Actually, what about your parents? I can't every week do my parents. Okay, my father in law, Tovia Ben Rabbach Yosef, my mother, Panina Parabas, Rabbi Tzvi, and everybody, and all the people in Moran, and the Holocaust, and everybody, they should all have an Aliyah. Everything is recorded on menachembarenfeld.com. If you have any questions, you want to reach Mordechai. Mordechai, what's your cell phone number again? They want to call you later tonight. What time? <laughs> Please email coachmenachem at gmail.com before the emails to, uh, to Mordechai Weinberger, and I'm sure he'll try to get back to it. And uh, anybody, Mordechai, when the book comes out, please let us know about it. It's, it's going to be an amazing book. And this is just, and then we're just touching little parts of the book. Am I correct? We didn't even get to any of the solutions yet. We didn't right. even discuss solutions, which is a whole right. separate program. But okay. yeah. Okay, again, this is Shear number 54. It's all going to be pre-recorded. It's going to be on the Colossian. We'll send out the email. It's also going to be on our phone number, 848-777-GROW. And again, I want to thank all our advertising sponsors, Lakewood Scoop, Rabbi Yaniv Chavon Chazak, Chayla Kaufman, Shul Summer, JCN, everybody. And uh, closing words first, Coach Menachem, and then Mordechai Weinberger. Mordechai, I want to give you a personal shkoyach. Today's information, I think, uh, is really unbelievable. And uh, I want to mention that you you are calling the book Thrive because um, living with a challenge is just not possible to, to continue as, as is. You have to implement things to start thriving to be able to continue. And like you mentioned, the mindfulness. Mindfulness does not work if you know about it. You have to actually practice it. And uh, I've seen myself practicing it and then going for a few weeks knowing about it, but it doesn't work. You have to continue and doing it again. The two, um, I want to share two ways how to do it. And again, it's not, not easy, but number one, journaling. 
can help if you sit down. You can even write with your left hand because people are perfectionists. I don't like to write, the spelling, leave everything aside. Just sit down with your left hand and just start writing whatever goes through your mind. And you'll see there's a lot going on. Just keep on writing for a few minutes. And then the other thing is going into nature, again, without your cell phone. And like I mentioned, a lot of times you can find a quiet place to sit there without the cell phone. So many ask, so what am I supposed to do there? Nothing. Like we discussed before, just count your breath. It sounds easy, but it's very hard. Try to do it and see how long you can do it. The first day you'll do 10, breath, 10 breaths. The second day you'll do 20. And don't, you know, don't be hard on yourself. But you have to actually practice to be able to feel the results. So again, thank you very much. And tonight, there's a lot of information. I guess we will have to follow up with the skills or we'll have to buy the book in Mitzvah Shem. And Mitzvah Shem should be lots of atzlocha with the book. Amen. Mordechai Weinberger, four zeros. I would like to close with a nice story. I had the schos to speak at a certain convention. There was about a thousand people there. And as I get to my room, on the bed, there is a gift. And I'm shocked because who knew where it was and what's going on. And the director tells me, read it. So I open up the gift and there it says, thank you for creating the relationship or helping me build again the relationship with my parent. At the end of Shabbos, that person came over to me and told me, I'd like to appreciate and thank you even more. And it ended up being, it was a silver um, salt holder. And I use it many times on Shabbos, just as that memory. And it was very simple. She told me she was amongst there with many people that were there for various reasons. And there were about a group of 15 people, men and women together, were all sharing how they disconnected from their parent. And if a parent has a personality disorder, there is no hope to connect. And what this client told me, which is years later, it's when, we, when, when they met me, they were sharing that, you know something? Through your work, through the group and other therapists I sent them to, I have an amazing relationship with a fully diagnosed personality disorder parent. And yes, at times this client went through quarantine. I just want us to realize you can have some form of relationship. You can even have a great relationship depending on the illness of, of the person and depending how strong you are. But it is possible. And I want you to know if it's just a complicated person, not a diagnosis, you can have a beyond fantastic and great relationship with them and learning, as Coach Menachem said, thriving, developing your muscles, your relationship, that fear of, of negative people and getting powerful and embracing that. Wow, it will change your life all over. Let's start thriving and not fearing complicated people. Atzlacha, everyone, and thank you for listening. Yeah. Everybody, next uh, right, 523. We'll see you there. Thank you. Have a good yontif. Take care.